the Fed is hiking pretty aggressively into an economy that's very clearly slowing down. We're going through a period where the economy appears to be weakening further. What I worry is on the other side, that the Fed uh, works too fast and too much. They essentially must hike and must, con and must tighten policy if they don't see inflation coming down to 2%. Come on, we're going to go into recession. Major economies are going to go into recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Payrolls Friday, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures unchanged, TK on the S&P. The jobs number a few hours away. Huge anticipation here, John. And I think a real mystery all in all to jobs. But what's really interesting, and we're going to address this in a moment, Global Wall Street, Dominic Constum to join us here in minutes. And I'm sorry, it's a theory Friday, John. Theory matters today. Day, and that's the guesstimate of where we'll be in 12 months. Dom's looking for a soft landing in the US economy. We can build on that. TK, for me, we're all looking at 250K as the median estimate in our survey for payrolls a little bit later this morning. And many people ask the same question. Pockets of weakness through this economy right now. Does it show up in this labor market report or is it too soon? Ed Hyman and Julian Emanuel, I believe they clock in at a lesser number, 175. And there's that whole angst, John, of what claims are doing and where we're going. The dynamic here, and John, it's really squishy. It's the dynamic of jobs and maybe lack of jobs with wages, and let's call it Wages Friday. The range is wide, Bramo. It always is. 320K at the high end, and at the low end, I think it's about 50K. So there you go. I'm just trying to wrap my head around, is it Wages Friday, is it Theory Friday, I mean, or is it Jobs Friday? Some complaints when it's ECI Friday, I and now he wants to call it Wages Friday. Exactly, or Theory Friday, but I think right now it is Jobs Friday, and we are looking to the labor market, in particular the participation rate. And Tom, you were highlighting this in your chart earlier this morning, and this is really the key question. How much slack is there? How much can we see a weakening without the unemployment rate going up significantly? What are we seeing from the JOLTS data? And then how does the Fed use this at a time <laughs> when anecdotally, yes, things are weak weakening, Yes, not only that, you also are seeing prices come down in certain quarters at the same time that you've got that incredibly hot CPI and you have it around the world. At the same time, you've got a market rally we need to discuss as well. Three whole weeks of it on the Nasdaq, on the S&P 500. Tom, and we talked about this wall of doubt. All the banks lining up. Bank of America, Goldman. HSBC, Barclays. What did HSBC call this yesterday? Wishful thinking. It's unloved. And what's interesting is the reaffirmation of not gloom. Gloom overdoes it. But the tentativeness, the timidity of this into the weekend is extraordinary, John. The timidity is off the chart. It like is Crystal he, Palace, Arsenal, Friday, Tom. Yeah, it That's is. That's what it is. It is the sound it's, of Premier it's, League football. It's, no, it's, it's not, guys. It's Padres, Dodgers, is Friday. Is that what you're going to call it? We're going to stay up late. Padres, Dodgers, Friday. It's, it's like, it's like this really? is magical, John. This is, this Why is, are we this? Ah. this is magical. No. Nah. It's just not working for me, Tom. Futures unchanged on the S&P, on the Nasdaq right now, down about a tenth of 1%. I'll whip through the price action. Elise is going to whip you through the day ahead. Yields are unchanged, basically, up not even a basis point at a 10-year, 269.72. Can we get used to this, Lisa? Crude with an 88 handle, yeah. 88.72, up two tenths of 1%. Yeah, and how much is this a short-term story versus a long-term story, and how much, we've been talking about this consistently throughout the year, how much does the decline in oil prices rely on China remaining in a zero-COVID policy and that demand not coming back online? The big number of the day, I would call it Jobs Friday or Non-Farm Payrolls Friday. Uh, we get that report at 8.30 a.m. John was just mentioning 250,000 is the estimate. I'm watching underneath that headline number. What do we see in average? hourly earnings. We have seen them trending down just a little bit year over year. The expectation is for that to continue and go below 5% year over year to 4.9%. What does that tell us about how much of a non-wage spiral there is, how much the Fed has to respond to this element? In other words, also how much momentum there is in the labor market. There also is a host of Fed speak led off by Tom Barkin of the Richmond Fed. How much does he speak to this participation rate and to the compressed yield curve? The 210 spread now at the low is going back, the most inverted going back to year 2000. Is this a good thing? Does this mean that the Fed is having the effect that they want? Or does this concern them because they might be moving too fast and front loading in a way that really does undermine momentum that could lead to some sort of soft landing? And at 9.30 a.m., uh, U.S. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh 
is joining Bloomberg Television with one and only John Farrow. I'm very curious to hear what he has to say with the messaging so tricky at a time where the Federal Reserve and even a lot of Congress members are saying we need the labor market to cool off in order for this economy to get back under control and get some price uh, control in uh, the economy. This is not a comfortable message. And so how does he talk about that? We'll have a very serious conversation on Bloomberg Radio as well. Lisa, thank you for that. Mike McKee and Tom want me to ask about the Red Sox. So I'll try and squeeze that in, Tom, at the end of the interview. Before we get to Secretary Walsh, we've got to talk about Secretary Blinken. TK out today saying that China has chosen to overreact yeah. <clears throat> to Speaker Pelosi's visit. And headline after headline just drop it around this story throughout this morning. It's a movable feast right now, John, and into the weekend as well. You wonder when the White House will make some uh, formal statement. I did notice the sanctions of China on Speaker Pelosi. Any extra headlines will bring them to you as we count our way down to payrolls Friday, 8.30 Eastern time. Joining us now is Dominic Constam, head of macro strategy at Mizuho America. Dom, let's start here. Soft versus hard. You think we can engineer a soft landing, Dominic. Why? Oh, well, first of all, you've got to define what you mean by soft landing. And uh, we define it in the context of the sensitivity of inflation to slower growth. So if inflation is very sensitive, uh, then you're not going to give up that much growth in order to bring it down a lot. And there are essentially three things that kind of drive that view. Uh, uh, a couple of them are very explicit in the Fed's view. One is that inflation expectations are coming down, and that links directly to lower inflation. That's kind of the Bullard view. That's about Fed credibility. The, the second thing is beverage curve, which is Waller's view. The idea that essentially excess demand for labor drives up wages, vacancies are too high, they're coming down now. We got that JOLTS report that gives you a ratio of 1.8 now of vacancies to, to unemployment. So that's a very positive, positive thing. And the third thing, which I don't think a lot of people talk about, but it's pretty clear, is that profit margins actually expanded during COVID. So that meant companies were able to pass on cost inflation into higher prices directly, which is very, very unusual. They were able to do it because of the fiscal stimulus. That's gone. Those profit margins can absorb cost inflation. Even if wages don't come down, you can actually get inflation coming down. So there's, there, there is this path to a soft landing. I don't see why uh, uh, people think it's such, a, such an elusive thing. Uh, obviously, if it doesn't happen, then it's going to be a hard landing. But you've basically got a several months where you really should be expecting a soft landing, I would argue. Uh, Dominic, I, I want to talk about the, uh, the, the way we push against the Phillips curve and maybe even the beverage curve as an exercise in Euclidean uh, geometry. Do we really know where we are? Are on the continuum of jobs and wages right now, or is it truly an unknown as we decide soft or hard landing? Well, I think ex post, you, you sort of can see where we are. And, but going forward, you know, there's a reasonable argument to, 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 to say that maybe we don't really know. Um, but uh, ex post, since July last year, the betas of wages to unemployment are off the charts. I mean, there's been an amazing acceleration in wage inflation. And you see it in, in lots of different measures. You see it, obviously, in the ECI. You see it across age cohorts. So without question, uh, there seems to be this sort of wage pressure. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, that's when you look at the jobs report, you sort of focus on that decline in wage inflation. And if unemployment isn't really going up that much, that means that wage beta is just collapsing, uh, which says that it's kind of reflecting the excess demand for labor that we've seen in vacancies. So I think there is a, a, a good argument to say that the Phillips curve will flatten back down again uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, um, what I do is I look at the actual sectors uh, in the uh, in the labor mm -hmm. market, because there are four sectors, a handful of sectors that really drove this wage story. Uh, and people don't focus on it. And it's like freight uh, uh, health, uh, leisure, those are the sectors that were really COVID related. And those are the ones that are actually coming down quite fast. So again, it's another way of like digging deeper into data and getting a bit more optimistic that a soft landing is totally plausible. It, it may not be, uh, the, the, it may not be 100% you know, certain, but it's certainly the most likely scenario at the moment, I would suggest. Dominic, even if you're right theoretically, are you right politically at a time when the Fed is being pushed to do as much as possible? Are you right when you talk about a two-year yield getting down to 2.5% from 3% now at a time when the Fed is being charged with taking the helm and controlling inflation even though their policy has a lagging effect? So this is, you know, this is a great issue because this is defines the volatility in the front end, which has been, you know, tremendous. Uh, so we're very happy saying the long end is kind of well anchored. Soft landing, it's anchored, <clears throat> and hard landing, it will be anchored. It will be anchored there because the Fed will just have to do a lot, lot more. Uh, so when you see the data, you kind of have to divide it into two. If you see the wage data coming down uh, a lot, and let's say jobs are kind of as expected, you, I can interpret that as a, consistent with a soft landing. Some people will interpret it as that it's not sustainable, and you still need 
need a lot higher unemployment, and therefore the Fed has to be much more aggressive. And so you'll see the two notes struggling between those two scenarios. Uh, in the end, if it actual inflation comes down, then yes, the 2.5% two-year note is totally plausible. If we see inflation come down, uh, the rates market, in my view, will, 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 will do extremely well. Uh, the Fed does not need to go uh, much further, and, and you'll end up with a very sort of constructive outcome, not just for, for interest rates, uh, but also for risk assets. Uh, it's the uncertainty around that soft versus hard and, and, and how different people are focusing on different things. Uh, some people just do not, do not believe that wage inflation can stay down uh, if un unless unemployment goes up a lot. And that's why you, you get that volatility in the front end. But yes, net net, you know, the front end, in our view, uh, will become a buy on the soft landing view. Uh, but either way, the back end is, is well anchored. And that's where you can sort of, you know, find a better value. Uh, and I, I think that's why the curve is obviously sustainably flat as well. This is the perfect way to start the weekend, TK. The optimism of Dominic Constum. I think we'll all have 10 rounds yeah, well, of whatever Tom's been having. What I want to say I, here... I think that's perfect. John, Dom and I have known each other for years, years, years. I believe he didn't have his first gray hair at the time. And what's important here to what Dr. Constum is saying is, John, the rigor of the geometry he's talking about. And that's a rigor that you do hear from both parties, Waller and Summers. Folks, this is esoteric on a hot August Friday. John, this really really matters in the debate. And you saw the heat yesterday from the Bank of England, which one day Dominic Constant is going to run. You reckon? Dominic Constant, <laughs> number two of America's dumb. Good to catch up, sir, to get the alternative point of view on things. Very constructive. And Lisa, when you look at the data points, let's look at commodities too. Michael Hartner out with a note this morning. Oil's down 28% since the June 16th equity market lows. Copper's down 23%. Since the June 16th equity market lows, the Nasdaq's up close to 20%. Elon Musk coming out last night and seeing that every moment of his commodities complex has been coming down in terms of price over the past few months. Just idea being that inflation does seem to be rolling over. It's amazing how a market rally changes the mood <laughs> over the last three weeks. Just slowly. Just slowly. Futures on the S&P 500 unchanged. Great lineup through this morning. We'll catch up with Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman in the next hour on this equity market from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. China is striking back at the US. Beijing announced it will impose unspecified sanctions on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her family for her visit this week to Taiwan. Meanwhile, China is cancelling military and climate talks with the US and Chinese military forces are still conducting exercises around Taiwan. Democrats have agreed on a revised version of their tax and climate bill. They will drop a provision that would have narrowed a tax break for carried interest. They also altered a minimum tax on corporations and added a new 1% tax on stock buybacks. A pivotal vote in the 50-50 Senate, Democrat Kristen Sinema says she'll back the revised plan. There are signs that conditions in the U.S. labor market are easing. The July jobs report is out today, 8.30 a.m. New York time. It's forecast to show that the U.S. added 250,000 jobs, whilst the unemployment rate held close to a 50-year low last week. Applications for state unemployment insurance rose slightly and was near the highest level since November. And in the UK, the front runner to become the next prime minister says that a recession is not inevitable. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss spoke hours after the Bank of England warned that the UK is weeks from entering a recession that will last for more than a year. Truss told Sky News that the government can make it more likely the economy grows by cutting taxes. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mutika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Today, will we see the first cracks in the labor market? There's another shoe out there to drop. Will the labor economy break? Can the Fed deflate the demand for labor in the economy without pushing up unemployment? Today, Tom, John, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. We still have a lot of slack in the labor market. The labor market you know. is going to be seen as to whether it keeps the light green on go, go, go for this Fed. The July Jobs Report, today on Bloomberg Television and Radio. China has, China has chosen to overreact and use Speaker Pelosi's visit as a pretext.
to increase provocative military activity in and around the Taiwan Strait. The fact is, the Speaker's visit was peaceful. There is no justification for this extreme, disproportionate, and escalatory military response. That was Secretary Blinken there accusing the Chinese of overreacting. From New York City this morning, good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abrawitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro, counting you down to payrolls Friday. The data a couple of hours away. Futures doing not much at all on the S&P 500. Unchanged on the Nasdaq 100, down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year muted price action going into the big data point. 269.54 on a 10-year. TK, down in D.C., I know the focus is on China at the moment, but some good news for this White House from Senator Cinema. Well, it's good. We moved the legislation forward, I guess. I mean, that's the way to put it. Politico has a summary here of who's giving what to the senator from Arizona. She decided to come over here. David Gurr over at NPR features it up uh, today. And we go to our Emily Wilkins to actually find out what is going on. Emily Wilkins, let me cut to the chase. Is the senator from Phoenix beholden to the fat cats of Wall Street? I mean, at this point, she has certainly advocated in their interest, making sure to remove that narrow restriction of the um, capital interest tax that was initially going to be in there. Uh, it's something that she has fought for from the very beginning. Initially, Senator Joe Manchin said he wanted that to remain, uh, but she successfully <clears throat> right. pushed back because this is how it works. If okay, you're one of the senators, I, I get senators. it. I, you know, Emily, let me cut you off here because I think a lot of people on radio and TV want to know this. I get that Nadler of the Upper West Side, Maloney of the Upper East Side or Schumer, the senator of New York, would be helpful to Goldman Sachs and a million others, KKR, you know the names of all the victims that watch us each and every day. Why is a senator from Arizona getting such substantial support from New York Wall Street? Number one, she's been a senator who's been open to having their interests. And if if companies have an opening, they are going to take advantage of that as far as lawmakers who are sympathetic to them. On the other hand, you think about her state, Arizona, that is a state with a lot of retirees. Uh, they do have a certain amount of wealth. They are hoping to keep that. She really has been targeted by a number of ads and a number of groups who have really pushed for her to continue supporting their interests. And she certainly delivered with this announcement that's come last night. That's on one side, Emily. On the other hand, there was a new 1% excise tax put on share buybacks that will actually raise more revenue, or is projected to, that is being included in this legislation. Can you talk about how that came to pass, why that is okay with her and not the carried interest provision? So one of the main things that Democrats are really trying to do with this legislation is make sure that they are reducing the deficit. And so the idea is that if you have that carried interest being removed, you're going to have to bring something else to be a revenue raiser. This 1% tax, this was always on the table as a potential consideration. Uh, it's just that Democrats didn't want to raise taxes too much, or at least Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Sinema didn't want to raise them too much. So they initially went with that minimum 15% corporate tax. And they decided not to do the 1%, but now that you've got the, the carried interest off the table, they're bringing that back and they're having the 1% tax uh, for companies who do stock buybacks. So, uh, Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer says that he believes that overall this package is going to reduce the deficit by $300 billion. That's something that Democrats can really take back to their constituents, pitch them as a way that they're trying to be fiscally conservative during this time of high inflation, but also be able to get their objectives done on health care and climate. So when does this get past Emily. So we're going to see a procedural vote on the measure tomorrow, and then we're going to see a all-night voterama. Republicans are going to try voterama. and add amendments to this legend to kill it. And no, it's it's voterama. We've also uh, taken a look at the Senate parliamentarian because she does have to fully sign off on this package, say that everything can go through this very special reconciliation process. Uh, but should those two things happen, I mean, Democrats are moving forward on this. We could see final passage uh, perhaps this weekend, early next week, and the House is vowed to come back as soon as they can and actually move this legislation to President Biden's staff. Emily, what can we, I don't know if we can talk about this on air, particularly on radio with the regulations we have, but what happens at a Voterama? 
So to vote Obama, uh, basically Republicans and some Democrats will offer a number of amendments to this piece of legislation. Again, remember, we're using this special process called reconciliation. It allows Democrats to move the bill with only 50 votes, but it does give this opportunity for all of these amendments to be offered. And basically what Republicans are trying to do is craft particular amendments that some Democrats are going to feel urged to vote for and support. And then potentially once that amendment is added, hoping that that package does eventually go down. So it's going to be very interesting to kind of read the tea leaves on who votes for what, what winds up getting into the package at this point. But Democrats, you know, just a few weeks ago, they thought they'd get absolutely nothing. Now they actually have legislation. They have agreement from all 50 senators. It's within their grasp. They're looking at a really tough midterm and they want to get something done. Emily Wilkins down in D.C. Emily, thank you. TK, of course, everything is relative, but things getting a little bit better for this White House. They've got a better story to tell now than they did a month ago. Well, way better to tell. There's just no question about it. it can turn around. I thought Greg Vallier was fascinating yesterday, John, also about how the Republicans are giving it up. With the elections that we saw on Tuesday, uh, there were some challenges there for the GOP, and, of course, that makes it relatively better for the Democrats. Relatively so, Lisa, a little bit more balanced for that race for the Senate. Yeah, well, just I keep looking at gas prices. 50 straight days, more than 50 straight days of price declines for gasoline in the United States. How much will that alone give a popularity boost to the Republican, uh, to the Democrats rather, at a time when they need it? And then they also have this legislative win. On the other hand, to your point, how much are we seeing a wholesale rally versus a really different message being sent from the bond market versus the stock market? And that's what I've been thinking about because the stock market is saying something very positive. The bond market, it's a lot less clear in my I'm mind. I'm always uncomfortable when people say that though Lisa as if these two worlds are in separate rooms and they don't talk to each other and that's just not true Okay, but you have a J.P. Morgan model that came out and said that the S&P is currently implying about a 50 percent probability of recession, down from 91 percent probability uh, a few months ago. And you actually saw the probability increase for the same model in the Treasury market. So, yeah, perhaps they're not they're talking to each other. Or perhaps they're somehow consistent and just have different timings. But there is a different message, at least in the short term, being sent here. What is often the case, I think, is that you trade initially on lower yields. You take comfort from that and then you start to realize why yields are lower. And Lisa, maybe you don't take much comfort from that at all. The problem is, or perhaps the benefit for a lot of these companies, is that they can still make money and that in some ways they're an inflation hedge. Even if you get a downturn, they are making more revenues in absolute terms, even if on a real basis they're not. And this is something Tom's been talking about a lot, and I think that, that could be something supporting earning. Uh, you two agree rally. on something. We do. What a beautiful way to close out the week. That is lovely. He's watching the game. He's totally He's distracted. Out. He is not dialed in at all. Futures unchanged on the S&P. In the bond market, unchanged too. Payrolls, two hours away. 250K is your estimate from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this Friday morning. Good morning. Equity futures shaping up as follows. Totally unchanged on the S&P. Muted price action, as you might expect, going into payrolls two hours away on the Nasdaq down about a tenth of 1%. Off the lows at the middle of June, from June 16th, up by almost 20% on the Nasdaq 100. What a run that is, and we're heading for a third straight week of gains. We're doing that with this kind of move in the bond market, and this is what Bramo's talking about. A 17, 18 basis point move at the front end of the curve, higher, and yet that's your performance in the equity market over the last week. Pretty phenomenal stuff. Up another basis point or two this morning, Lisa, on a two-year to 3.0592%. The Fed and Fed speakers did everything we predicted that they would do. They talked up a hawkish game, and this equity market didn't really respond to it, Lisa. Yeah, even though, even as they talked up some sort of hawkishness, you saw on the long end of the yield curve, long-term bonds, those yields coming in. The opposite side of the story, also not very positive, and yet stock markets did not respond. In the FX market, here's a picture for you. Take a look at euro dollar, then we'll take a look at cable quickly. On the euro, <laughs> going into payrolls in about two hours from now, looking for 250K. We set up as follows at 102.36. If you want to check in on the house of sterling, Tom, we managed to squeeze out again yesterday. Just a little bit of sterling strength in response to what we heard from the Bank of England. 121.34, some weakness right now. But TK, wow, the headlines in the UK this morning on the yeah. front pages of the newspaper. Unbelievable. For this Bank of England, 
brutal. Yeah, there's no measurement of this, folks. For those of you waking up in America to describe the fury, and I don't mean that in terms of an opinion, but just the frenzy, the heat, the fury, John, across the United Kingdom media over Governor Bailey yesterday, I, I would call it unprecedented. Mohammed Al Arian, who I'll catch up with a little bit later this morning, oh, you will, Tom, on one of your other projects. He wrote on Bloomberg Opinion, almost welcoming the honesty of this central bank to tell us what they really think about the future and just how wide, how wide the range of outcomes could actually be. They're acknowledging all of those things, Tom. Can you imagine, though, we talked about this yesterday, if the Federal Reserve came out and did those things? Can, I, I know, cannot imagine. I don't even know if the Fed can do anything like that, Tom, even if they thought it. <clears throat> well, it's a different responsibility, but at the same time, I can't imagine it. There's no question uh, about it. And, John, what's interesting with, with Bailey's comments is you've got to believe we're going to see the path, the trajectory, trajectory, got it, rapidly from, you know, from his really grim view. So, Tom, we're talking about so soft landing or hard landing yeah. here in the United States. BNP Paribas, in their research, crash landing. That's what it said after the Bank of England yesterday. Yeah, what we're going to do right now is do a clinic on wages. Lisa mentioned that earlier. Sarah House joins us now, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Uh, Sarah, let me do the basics here. What's the difference between average hourly earnings and ECI earnings? Help our audience with this. Sure. So the average hourly earnings numbers, which we'll get a look at today, they come from the household survey that's housed under the employment situation report. So they are more timely than the employment cost index, but the employment cost index, it's fixed for composition. And importantly, it also includes benefits, which is about 30% of, of labor costs for employers. So it's a more encompassing look at the overall total costs for employment and the wage pressures and, and essentially the inflation pressures stemming from yeah. the labor market. Beautiful. So two different yeah. surveys, Beautiful. two different methodologies. Beautifully explained. I would love to do that. Sarah, what do they indicate right now? Do they both suggest an ebbing in wage pressures? So they both suggest that overall labor cost pressures are easing a bit, more so in the average hourly earnings numbers, which we expect we'll see some further easing today, at least if you're looking on a three-month annualized basis. But I think if you step back and you look at the overall rates of both, they are still pointing to a labor market that remains very strong and is contributing to above target inflation. So if you look at the ECI that we got for, for the second quarter, so we, wages and benefits are still growing at a 5.4% annualized pace in, in Q2. Now that was down from Q1, but even if you factor in some generous assumptions about productivity, which we're going to get a horrendous report here on that next week, I think you're still looking at, at labor costs pressure is still noticeably above the Fed's 2% target. So, you know, Fed might get some help on commodity prices. We're seeing things like goods pressures easing as transportation costs come down, but you really need the help from the labor market to bring inflation down to 2% on a sustainable pace. And we're just not there yet. Sarah, what does it tell you that we're still churning out these kind of payroll gains and yet unemployment hasn't moved lower? It's stabilized at 3.6%. Yeah, so I think overall, you, there's still some catch up to do in terms of the employment numbers. And I think that explains part of the, the discrepancy between the GDP numbers for the first half versus the employment numbers. But I think in terms of, of how the unemployment rate has, has been so sticky, I think in part um, that's suggesting that the trend in participation is higher, although we've seen it back off over the past couple months. So I think that's gonna be a hugely important number in today's jobs report. Do we begin to see that upward trend reassert itself or are we looking at potentially uh, still very sticky, low labor force participation because that also feeds back into where wage pressures might go if you're not getting help on the supply side of, of labor. Just a few minutes ago, Dominic Constum came on the show and said that people were overestimating how much wages were increasing because it was really stemming from a few sectors that were really disrupted from the COVID pandemic. Is that what you've experienced or do you see a sort of broader based wage gain that is going to be more alarming for the Fed and speaks to something other than the soft landing that some people are hoping for? Yeah, so I think it's actually been a, a bit broader. So certainly you have some standout sectors in terms like leisure and hospitality, 
transportation warehousing where wages are, are up by double digits over just over the past year, let alone since uh, since February 2020. But if you go back and you look at what's happened to the wage trends across the, you know a host of, of major sectors, so they are noticeably higher than what we were seeing over the last cycle. So that it extends to manufacturing, it extends to construction, it extends to professional and business services, it extends to education and health. And so I don't think you can really boil this down to to just one sector. I think we are seen broader price pressures uh, coming from the labor market than than just one or two industries. At the risk of uh, getting some uh, anger from my co-host John Farrow here, is good news going to be bad news for markets, (laughs) considering that a lot of people are hoping for the Fed to back off? Well, I think that so much of this is going to come down to to the composition. So, unlike I think some of the the other reports, it's not just about one number. You know, so we. I think it's going to be that intersection of the wage dynamics with participation, with the overall payroll numbers and and the unemployment rate. And so I think an an ideal situation for the Fed might be you see that participation rate coming back and wage growth cooling. So that suggests, again, you're getting help from from the supply side. So that's really the the easier way out for the Fed, which is going to limit how much the Fed will ultimately have to to raise rates. And I think if you can still put up some pretty strong job numbers, you know, a, a on the headline in terms of payrolls, if you are seeing that participation rate come back, if you are seeing wage growth cooling, I think overall that could be taken as, as a pretty good report. Just for the record, I don't get angry, Lisa. And not with you, ever. <laughs> not with me. You <clears throat> sometimes, Tom. Sometimes. Yeah. Sarah, looking ahead to next week, CPI, August 10th. Can we just finish mm-hmm. there? What are you looking for okay. on that particular data point? Yeah, so we're looking for another strong gain. So, you know, the headline's going to be weaker just because you had that huge pullback in in gasoline prices, but that shift from 1.3% to 0.2%, which is what we're looking for, it almost entirely stems from energy. You're going to get some temporary help from from autos, but I think importantly, you're still going to see the core coming in at, you know, 0.5, 0.6% rate, so still very hot. And I think if you look at the year-over-year numbers for core, those are actually hooking up. And so I think that's going to be very difficult for the Fed to to see that compelling evidence that uh, we are seeing underlying pressures in, in inflation cool here over the next few months in time for that September Fed meeting. Sarah, awesome, as always. Sarah House there of Wells Fargo looking ahead to payrolls a little bit later this morning. Then it's on to CPI next week on August 10th. And in our survey, I can give you a sneak peek of the numbers right oh, now. Please. Sarah did that for everyone anyway. We're looking for headline to come down from 9.1 to 8.8. We're looking for core, strip out food, strip out energy year over year to come up to 6.1 from 5.9. And they're the year over year figures. Here on Wall Street, a lot of people will be very focused on the month over month core number. And that's what this Fed will be focused on too, well, Tom. President yeah, Mester talked this, about it earlier this week. We're looking for that to come in at 0.5. And 0.5 is still pretty hot, Tom. Well, into your weekend reading, John, it's real simple. This was the theme of Monday, Tuesday this week. I think a lot of pros are really taken back by that monthly, that narrow view of the Dallas Trim Mean Report. I mean, a lot of people were talking about that uh, in the game. It's tangential to what people care about, but it, it's something that matters. You know, John, it's sort of like like how I feel about Connor Gallagher with that one year to Crystal Palace and now back with Chelsea. Oh, there you go. I mean, I don't think Crystal Palace can do it without Connor Gallagher. That's all there is to you're, it. You're fired up for the game later. I'm fired up for the game later. And what's really important, and John, we may be in London for the Crystal Palace Richmond Derby. I mean, I'm really looking I'm, forward I'm not sure that's, uh, uh, that's, to that. I'm not sure that's how that that particular game season works, two Tom. Ted Lasso Are you confused with Ted Lasso again. No, season two says Richmond's playing Crystal Palace. I'm, I'm sure that Tom, that's fictional. It's not real. When's season three happening? It's, what do you mean it's fictional? <laughs> Ted Lasso's not real, Tom. I hate to break it to you. It's not real. Season three's coming out, though. I'm sure they're going to write a nice story for you. It's fictional? It's fictional, Tom. I didn't. I, I know. It's a painful moment for you as you work this out. Futures, Lisa. Lisa's dying. Futures <laughs> unchanged on the <laughs> S&P. Just on the NASDAQ, we're down two tenths of one percent. <laughs> just let him keep digging. Well, can I just say one thing? And I know that you didn't get truly angry, but it's frustrating to you, John. I know that it is when people say, is good news, bad news, bad news, good news. But that actually is going to be pivotal to see the market reaction to the market re- to, the, to the labor well, market report. I the, think that's interesting. This is something else, John, this week that, 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 that Lisa brings up. The returns of managers right now 
I mean, I'm sorry. There's some brutality out there. There's some good news, bad news. What do we do? Let's take a bet. And there's some shellacking going on. Uh, look, I know people say all you want to talk about is the Fed. All we talk about is the Fed because a lot of the time all that matters is the Fed. <laughs> and I long for the days when that's not the case. Amen. Uh, and we can just talk about the data and good news is good news and, and bad news is bad news because to everyone else, bad news is just bad news. Yes, <laughs> it's certainly on Main Street. Uh, and you tune into these kind of conversations and they just sound, Tom, they sound alien-like and that's because of the involvement of central banks in markets over the last 15 years. John, I thought the Richmond oh, Man City game was just outstanding. You know, Jamie, Honestly, you're going to keep this up? No, I just think, don't give me this fictional stuff. That was a You think it's, game. it's real? Yeah. I'm sure you do. Future's unchanged on the S&P. Jamie Tart actually reminds me of you. One hour and 50 minutes. That's really rude. <laughs> Payroll's one hour and 50 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. China is lashing out at the U.S. for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan this week. Today, Beijing announced it is imposing unspecified sanctions on Pelosi and her family. China is also halting meetings with American military leaders and cooperation with the U.S. on drugs, climate and a number of other issues. U.S. health officials have declared monkeypox a public health emergency. That's a step that will free up funding, treatments and other services to fight the virus. The U.S. leads the world with known cases, more than 6,000 of them. For the fourth month in a row, global food prices have dropped. The United Nations Index of World Food Costs fell more than 8.6% in July. The index is now at its lowest point since January, before Russia invaded Ukraine. A major food exporter, still prices remain elevated. People on low incomes are feeling the pinch as the cost of living crisis deepens. South Korea has become the seventh nation to send spacecraft to the moon. The country launched its first home-developed lunar orbiter. It lifted off from Florida's Cape Canaveral on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The orbiter will travel for four and a half months before entering lunar orbit to begin its mission in December. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Better still, oh, we can avoid recession. We think we'll, we'll think we'll, we'll, we won't actually hit recession, a slowdown, but no recession. Come on, we're going to go into recession. Major economies are going to go into recession. If it's not going to be a deep recession in the same way as you know the financial crisis, um, but it's going to be prolonged. We need to do a roundtable. That was Lee Ferridge of State Street Global Markets and put him alongside Dominic Constant of Mizuo because Dom is, is not taking that path at all. He thinks we can engineer oh, a soft landing, Tom. That yeah. is the debate right now. Tom Keane, Lisa Abramitz and Jonathan Ferro going into payrolls. The data about an hour away, an hour and 30 minutes or something like that. Futures right now on the S&P unchanged on the S&P on the Nasdaq, negative by not even two tenths of one percent. No real drama here. Pretty muted price action. Tom yields up about a basis point. Your tenure, 270. Randall Krasner to join us later as we dive into Jobs Day. We'll do that in less than two hours. And what we're doing here is what surveillance is about to bring to you on radio and television the debates that are out there. And they are heated now on the path of the American labor economy. We heard from Dominic Constant. Anna Wong joins us now, Bloomberg Chief U.S. Economist. And maybe more than anyone I know, Anna Wong is moving the other way. Anna, we can wax philosophical about the theory of the Phillips curve, the beverage curve, the shift in the beverage curve, et cetera. You say this is a Chairman Powell who is not very curvy and he will just raise rates to bring inflation down. How can he ignore theory? Well, I, I think the theory, that's the thing. Theory is very clean. The theory uh, will tell you that as, uh, you know, as if you want to bring vac uh, vacancy rate down, you need to increase unemployment. But it is empirics that ultimately settle the matter of how much unemployment rate has to rise as you bring down the vac uh, vacancy rate. And right now, the debate is exactly on how curvy is, is that curve. And I tend to side on, uh, side, side with the Summers uh, camp in, in thinking that it, 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 based on what we have seen since 1950s, I think the hope for, you know, little increase in unemployment as we break down vacancy rate, that, that's wishful thinking. 
I look at the wishful thinking now, and what it says to me, Anna Wong, is this is, is simply a Fed inflation-centric. Do they care about this morning's jobs report? Well, um, one report wouldn't make a whole lot of difference, but one report does help them f uh, feel like are they are they uh, making progress. So if um, if unemployment rate stays high, uh, stays I mean sorry, stays stays low at three point six percent, and we did see vacancy rate coming down uh, in the June JOLTS report, that means that um, you know maybe the 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 Fed. Um, uh, is taking some solace in in uh, in in, uh, in in the chance of getting a soft landing, but I would just say that uh, not so fast yet. Um, typically, the vacancy rate can come down, and an unemployment rate will lag by a little bit. I would be paying more attention uh, in today's report on the labor participation rate, and I think the Fed will as well, because you know. At the end of the day, what you want and what the Fed wants is for wage growth to cool. In order to get wage growth to cool, you need more labor supply or you get less labor demand. And in the last three months, we have not been seeing good news on the labor participation front. Uh, and this means that the Fed will have to do more on dampening the demand side. And that wouldn't be good for rates outlook. Anna, what is a soft landing? Well. The Fed's definition is if it uh, if the unemployment rate ri rises by about one percentage point. So if we get to, you know, l if it's less than five, slightly higher than four, that would be the Fed's uh, definition of so well, soft landing. The reason why I ask is because I wonder how much daylight there really is between some of the arguments for people calling for a soft landing, like Dominic Constum, uh, versus though calling for a greater likelihood of a hard landing. How much is this just a distinction of the contours of a recession that is somewhat inevitable just in terms of year-over-year -year, uh, comparisons? Yeah, I, I think you know economists, analysts. We we argue about soft landing, hard landing. At the end of the day, the people on, in the main street will feel equally painful. Whether you know, in a soft landing scenario, just one percent increase in, one point five percent increase in an unemployment rate. It will be uh, yeah, a lot of people will be millions will be losing jobs. And I've got a difficult question on a difficult Friday. Is the path of a lower inflation rate a relatively smooth and gradual path removed from shocks, or does it have some real kinks to it? Does it have stopping points along the way? I think, Tom, you, you, that's a rhetorical question. I think basically, you're, I think what you're uh, you know, uh, implying is, yes, it's a stopping point. There's plenty of stopping points. It's not smooth at all. I mean, uh, I think what likely will happen is that the transitory components of inflation indeed will, you know, will, will decelerate very quickly going into next year, and we might see, you know, headline inflation going down very sharply. But then there's also the sticky part that will persist to be sticky, such as core services, the parts that's driven by elevated wage inflation. So, so. Uh, you know, th there may the Fed might be seduced to pause rate hikes later next year because the transit component will drive overall inflation down closer to three or four. But then, if they don't keep rates high, or even if they pause, then inflation come back, come back, come back up because you still have that really sticky core components that's pushing it up. And we saw what happened to Arthur Burns in 1974. There was a there was a steep recession in 74. I mean, um, I, yes, I think history judged that. them very yes. harshly because how would you know that right. prices wouldn't come down in an inflation uh, in a recession, right? Um, but we'll John, know. I remember it's, Arthur Burns well, Tom, in '74. Nobody, about it. nobody There's watching or listening does. <laughs> Only I remember Arthur Burns. Anna 74. Wong of Bloomberg Economics. Anna Wong, go away. That was a clinic. <laughs> Anna, thank you. Tom, you <laughs> saw it. Lisa and I read about it. Anyway. Well, anyway. you got me going. Come on. The interview of the Final week, fire. John, was Dissel of Federated Hermes and her gloom about sure. the dismal '70s. I go back to something I, that, that was Hamid stunning wrote in the last couple of weeks, Tom. The last couple of months, actually, the prospect of a flip-flopping Fed. If they pause too early, do they have to go again? Uh, what are we going to do at 7%, at 6%? Besides, we're going to be employed over these raging debates. I mean, it's going to be great, John. But I just refuse to believe it's nice, one nice, smooth curve down to 2%. Elisa's raised the same question, though. What are we going to do? We're going to start cutting as soon as we stop hiking? 
Lisa, is that what people are looking for now? That's essentially oh. what people are looking for, that once they hit their peak, it'll be the shortest ever time at that peak before they start cutting. That's basically experiencing uh, the potential for some sort of significant downturn, <clears throat> because otherwise, how can the Fed get the conviction that it is not a repeat of the 1970s? You're not going to see that resurgence that's going to cause that flip-flopping that could be perilous to the reputation that's already potentially somewhat compromised. Alan Ruskin of Deutsche Bank's done some work on that. He thinks they stay up there for longer. Next time Alan comes on, we can talk to him about it. Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs is going to weigh in on this equity market in a moment. And what a rally it's been. Up almost 20% from the June 16th low on the Nasdaq 100. That is quite a rally. Futures right now down about a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq, on the S&P. Softer by a tenth of 1%. Also, yields are higher by a single basis point. Let's round that up for you to 270 on a US 10-year. Going into the payrolls data about an hour or so away. Payrolls expected to come in at about 250k. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. The Fed is hiking pretty aggressively into an economy that's very clearly slowing down. We're going through a period where the economy appears to be weakening further. What I worry is on the other side that the Fed uh, works too fast and too much. They essentially must hike and must, con and must tighten policy if they don't see inflation coming down to 2%. Come on. We're going to go into recession. Major economies are going to go into recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A lovely ferry just State Street. He's just like, behave yourself. You know where this is going. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Payrolls Friday alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown with some Jonathan Farrow. Futures unchanged on the S&P. TK, the data, 90 minutes away. We're going to see the data in 90 minutes, John. It's going to be interesting to go beneath the headline data, maybe more than ever. you got to go right to wages. That seems to be where the debate is. That seems to be where... Uh, the dynamic is uh, this morning, and I, I like your idea, John, on monthly inflation data, maybe monthly wage data matters as well. What's more important for this Fed, Tom? Today's jobs report, next oh, week's no. CPI ne report. Inflation report. In my opinion, no question, next week's August 10th report is important, but there'll be dynamics within this report that will allude to that. At least looking for headline inflation next week to come down. Core to remain hot. At what point does the market respond to this in a negative way? There uh, how much? No, I, I'm, I'm serious because we've been talking about the signs of recession and the gloom and the doom and the leaf areas of the world have been very uh, vocal about their opinion. And we really haven't seen it in markets. We've seen an incredible rally. We've seen a loosening in financial conditions at the same time that we're going to get a CPI print that's going to still be very hot. If it comes down to 8.8 percent, that's still 8.8 percent, which is a pretty hefty inflation read year over year. Nonetheless, job gains have been robust in recent months and the unemployment rate has remained low. That was the Fed in the first line of the statement, the first paragraph of the statement, Lisa, <clears throat> just last week. That jobs report is going to become very important for them if it starts to decelerate. I would imagine a lot of people become even more confused as to what the Fed's about to do. Which is the reason why perhaps the labor market report may be less interesting than the market's reaction to it. Where is the balance of risk in markets? Is it to a labor market that's continuing to be robust and strong? Or is it the opposite, hinging a bet on a weakening in the labor market that we saw in the rise in jobless claims at a time <clears throat> when the Fed needs that to back away from rate hikes? Lisa, I love it when we're on the same page. It's always about how the market responds to the data. That's where the information is. Where's the information here? The S&P 500 consumer discretionary, I keep going back to this, is up 25% from the June lows. Lisa, what business does consumer discretionary have up 25% from the June lows on a month where we've all been talking about recession in America? The one argument that I've heard about this that makes a lot of sense is it depends which consumer discretionary. If you're talking about companies that cater to the wealthiest Americans, those are going to still be doing okay considering the stockpiles of cash that those <coughs> individuals still have, at least if you look at averages. On the other hand, if you're looking at, for example, the beginning of another cycle, Mm, perhaps that holds a little less water right Let's now. Let's get you some price action this Friday. It's shaping up as follows. Futures unchanged on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down a tenth of 1%. Just a moment, Lisa will bring you the day ahead. The jobs number's just around a corner. Yields up about a basis point on a 10-year, 269.72. Tom, I can't get used to this. 88 on crude. 
Where did that come from? Yeah, this is actually very tangible, John. We've really seen this uh, in all sorts of features. I'd also note, besides West Texas Intermediate 88, John, the important Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index really shows an accommodation. Lisa, as equities have ripped, commodities have been hammered. Yeah, and this really is potentially a recession call, and yet it's also given some momentum to some of the gains that we've seen because that is a rolling off in headline inflation. For that main number of the day, 8.30 a.m. non-farm payrolls report for the month of July. And Tom is right. It is not just the headline number, which is expected to be around 250000 Dig beneath the surface. Average hourly wages, how much are they coming down? Do they go to the expense? 4.9% gain year over year. And is that enough for the Fed to say, okay, momentum is cooling a little bit? The other side of this that I'm really looking at, as Anna Wong was saying, is the participation rate. It has been declining. This doesn't make a lot of sense for a market where there are a lot of open jobs and people have an easier time uh, getting uh, positions. At what point do we see this continue plateau? What does this tell us about the state of the jobs market? And today we get a host of Fed speak as well. Uh, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin among them. I want to see what he says about the yield curve. This is sending a very strong signal if you believe in history. This basically is the steepest inversion going back to the year 2000. This usually portends recessions. And this has only been deepening as the Fed has jawboned uh, markets, the short end of the yield curve, higher in terms of yields and leading to longer term recession expectations. Does he respond to this in any way or does he hold the course and continue to say they need to do more to fight inflation? At 9.30 a.m., the messaging from this administration will be really interesting to watch. U.S. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh will be joined, uh, will be joining John Farrow on Bloomberg Television. How John, come he we're really come excited. On earlier? What's well, that I'm actually really curious to see how they oh. shape a message around this. <laughs> I really want to know, John, and especially because they got to basically say <clears throat> a softening is required in order to get inflation down. But the message always has to be, we want people to be employed. We want people to be paid. Can I just clarify Tom's snarky comment? Tommy can't come on earlier. He has to wait an hour for the payrolls report to come out to then talk yeah, about but, the payrolls but, report. You know the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah OK. OK. I, 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 thank you for reminding okay, good, me, Good, good, good. Bank of America say take profit on the bear rally. HSBC, they've added to this. They say it's time to ditch stocks. Barclays say the emerging Goldilocks narrative <clears throat> feels misplaced. Every rally is built on wishful thinking. It's just whether that wishful thinking is misplaced or not. Peter Oppenheimer at Goldman joins us right now to try and answer that question. Peter, help me out. The wishful thinking currently, misplaced or not? Well, I have to say, I, th I think it is. Um, I can understand why stocks have rallied and as you uh, have quite rightly pointed out, you've seen a significant pullback in interest rates, and the market seems to be more convinced that inflation is close to a peak. And given that rates rising were really the trigger of this bear market to begin with, particularly for long duration stocks, it's provided relief. But if it's indicating that a recession is coming, it seems premature for equities really to have troughed and for this rally to have been the genuine inflection point. Peter, I want to go to your European constituency. I usually don't do this because we're so American-centric at 7.06 a.m. in New York, but this really matters. Peter, the theme is quality and buy America. Should Europe institutional buy side load the boat on America and load the boat on quality shares in America? Well, I, I think to a large extent that's already what's been happening uh, for a long time. Uh, the U.S. has hugely outformed Europe, and much of that was justified by much stronger economic growth in the U.S. and by U.S. profits outpacing those in Europe significantly, partly because it had a lot of exposure to technology stocks, which Europe did not have. Uh, the weaker euro has also added another incentive for European investors to get access to U.S. assets. And so we have seen, I think, quite a lot of flows coming out of Europe uh, into the US. And given the obvious concerns at the moment uh, in Europe, uh, as well as in other areas, but in Europe specifically around gas supplies, that's probably going to continue. One thing I would say, though, is that Europe also has its fair share of quality, strong balance sheet, stable companies, and they have been outperforming in the European market quite strongly. 
Well, Peter, given the fact that you do see a much more dire picture in general overall for Europe than the U.S., I was looking underneath at your GDP calls, and you actually see Europe doing better than expected, better than the consensus, and you see the U.S. economy doing worse than consensus. Do you think it's time to actually buy into the European story because things have been beaten up so much because the consensus has been too bearish, in your view? Well, I think that uh, we do see a recession uh, in Europe, a relatively modest one, and there are some important supports that are worth emphasising. You know, Europe's private sector balance sheets are quite strong. Uh, banks finally have strong balance sheets, uh, so do corporates, and households have accumulated lots of savings. That's been true in the US, but they've been run down more quickly in the US. So those things won't prevent a recession, but they may moderate the extent of it. And bear in mind also, in Europe, unlike the US, there's quite a big fiscal boost coming through, which will help to dampen the downside. Having said all of that, of course, uh, you know, the European markets are very exposed to global growth, which is clearly slowing, uh, a, a pullback in world trade growth and a slowdown in China in particular is also not very helpful. Uh, and so I think there are pockets of Europe that are, are looking interesting. Uh, there's the energy and commodity exposure, which we're structurally positive on, and there's quite a lot of exposure to. Uh, but we think that people really need to be quite selective and not really look so much at the country or the industry in which their investment prospects are based, but more really on the quality of balance sheets and the cash sustainability. Peter, just finally, Arsenal Palace a little bit later. What are you looking for? Uh, that should be a, an easier prediction, I think, with Arsenal. I, I'm, an, I'm a Londoner, so I have to say that, although, as you know, my, my team is Tottenham, so perhaps I shouldn't. Well, that's why I asked. Is your side of North London, Tom? Yeah, well, I don't know. You know, I expect we need Oppenheimer on Soccer Saturday on Sky TV. We could I make mean, that work. You know, I, uh, Tom, I, you'd I think be great. I see Peter there. Hey, Peter, wouldn't Tom be great after, on Soccer after Saturday? After England's great, great success in the in the Euro final, I, I'd be I'd be happy to do that. We're very proud here. I there mean, you go, Peter. Do you want to get in here on Liz Truss and Sunak? I mean, Sunak's all Southampton. <laughs> so I mean, does that does that play into what we're going to see with the Tots on Saturday? <laughs> Can't comment on that one. I, don't I know. think you take a pass on the leadership Goldman, race, John, TK. Compliance on Goldman Sachs just fell into the River Thames. I'm aware. They're behind the camera right now saying, no, <clears> don't <throat> answer that. Yeah. Peter, thank you. Peter Oppenheimer there of Goldman Sachs. Thank you. Looking ahead to the weekend, Tom, you'd be great on that show. I shouldn't oh, be pushing you to another broadcast. I thought it but... was pretend. I mean, you know, you know, you look at the, the tr true nonfiction of Ted Lasso. Now, this is real life stuff, Tom. It, it was like a show, is, and it's like real, real life. Right? This is real life. Yeah. Just about, I Have think. you ever been on it, John? To what, Tom? Soccer Saturday. No, I haven't. They never invited me. But I am employed here, Tom, and that oh, might okay. be why. Okay. I mean, it, it's good. I'll try I mean, and figure it out for you next season. Is that where you'd like good. me to go? Am I pushing you no. there or are you pushing me? No, I just think you could be a guest on there. It really showed more well, What I would love size. to do is the Italian football. Your sensitive Tom. side. I would, I would love to do Serie A just, just on a Sunday evening, just as a hobby. Yeah. I'd Look love at those to do features. that. Look at that happen. Futures up, but down rather. By Grandma 10. Cam says Pay attention, Lisa. Day. Yields up. My <laughs> basis point. I'm stuck. Seriously. Sub 270 <laughs> on a 10 year, 269. Payroll's just around the corner. Coming up shortly. Thank God for that. And then and Morgan Stanley and Nadia Lovell of UBS. Looking forward to those conversations in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. China is striking back at the US. Beijing announced it will impose unspecified sanctions on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her family for her visit this week to Taiwan. Meanwhile, China is cancelling military and climate talks with the US and Chinese forces are still conducting exercises around Taiwan. There are signs that conditions in the U.S. labor market are easing. The July jobs report is out today at 8.30 a.m. New York time. It's forecast to show that the U.S. added 250,000 jobs, whilst the unemployment rate held close to a 50-year low. Last week, applications for state unemployment insurance rose slightly and was near the highest level since November. Democrats have agreed on a revised version of their tax and climate bill. They will drop a provision that would have narrowed a tax break for carried interest. They also altered a minimum tax on corporations and added a new 1% tax on stock buybacks. A pivotal vote in the 50-50 Senate, Democrat Kristen Sinema says she'll back the revised plan. 
And the price of oil is headed for its biggest weekly decline since early April. West Texas Intermediate was trading at around $89 a barrel, down about 10% for the week. There is increasing evidence that a global slowdown is destroying demand in the U.S. Gasoline consumption has softened whilst oil stockpiles have increased. And Tesla CEO Elon Musk says he sees, he sees signs that the global economy has gone, quote, past peak inflation. Musk spoke at the carmaker's annual meeting at its new factory in Texas. He said Tesla's commodity and component costs are trending downward. Musk also reiterated that he expects a mild recession that could last 18 months. Global News, I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Today, will we see the first cracks in the labor market? There's another shoe out there to drop. Will the labor economy break? Can the Fed deflate the demand for labor in the economy without pushing up unemployment? Today, Tom, John, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. We still have a lot of slack in the labor market. The labor market yeah. is going to be seen as to whether it keeps the light green on go, go, go for this Fed. The July Jobs Report, today on Bloomberg Television and Radio. The United States will be resolute, but also steady and responsible. We do not believe it is in our interest, Taiwan's interest, the region's interest, to allow tensions to escalate further. That was John Kirby, the spokesperson at the U.S. National Security Council from New York City with Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow, counting you down to payrolls one hour and about 12 minutes away, looking for something like 250K on the headline number. That's the median estimate in our survey. Futures down a tenth on the S&P on the Nasdaq still heading towards a third straight week of gains. We're softer there by two tenths of one percent. Yields just a little bit higher by a basis point, 269.72. I keep going back to crude, 87 handle yeah. now. Down seven tenths of one percent, 87 and about 90 cents. Keep an eye on that. We heard from Secretary Blinken a little bit earlier, Tom. His words, China has chosen to overreact to Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And it is a simplistic analysis, and that's what we're seeing right now. To help us with the complexity of Taiwan and China, Emily Wilkins joins now. Bloomberg government reporter. Emily, I'll cut to the chase, and I'm, you know, I'm vamping here off of the expertise of someone like James Stravitas, the admiral, with all of his experience. There are 166 islands of Taiwan. The complexity here for the USS Ronald Reagan, the Navy, and Secretary Blinken is exceptional, isn't it? It really is at this point, Tom. I mean, what we are seeing right now, it seems to be a continual escalation of tensions. The fact that now Beijing has halted <clears throat> conversations with the U.S. over military, over climate, the fact that we are still seeing these massive military drills and uh, test missile strikes, and the fact <clears throat> that we are now seeing sanctions on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her immediate right. family. This is notable because the U.S. had the opportunity to sanction the number three politician in China. China and decided not to do so after those okay. security restrictions were put in Hong Kong. So this does seem to be a bit of an escalation. And the White House actually asked uh, the China ambassador to the U.S., Qing Gong, to come to the White House yesterday so they could reiterate to him that the U.S. does not want an escalation. They do not want to have conflict in that region. They want to keep the status quo. But Qing <clears throat> Gong wrote in an op-ed in the Washington Post saying that when Speaker Pelosi came over to Taiwan that she had brought broken the U.S.'s promise to not establish diplomatic relations with Taiwan right. and that that needed to be addressed strongly. A few years ago, like 70, there was an island off Florida called Cuba, which I think was 90 miles away is my recollection. Most of our listeners and viewers understand that Afghanistan is over there, even Iraq is over there, and most certainly Taiwan is on the other side of the world. How is the White House dealing with the distance to Taiwan, the unimaginable reach that the Pentagon has to deal with. 
I think to a certain extent, there is a sense that it's not just about Taiwan, although that's certainly part of it, but it's also about the U.S. relationship with China. And the atmosphere in Washington these days is really united. The fact that there are concerns about China's rise in prominence, that there are concerns about some of the things it's done with climate, with human rights, and that there is a need for the U.S. to really stay on its toes and make sure that they are keeping pace with its own economic growth and really being cognizant of the relationship they're having with China. And of course, Taiwan is such a key piece of that, as the last several weeks have shown. And so I think that just plays a huge portion into exactly how Washington thinks about the situation over there. Yes, it is far away. Yes, probably Americans struggle to find it on a map. But I think most Americans, they know sort of what the U.S.'s relationship with China is, and it's something of interest to them. The Taiwan Defense Ministry just said in a statement that 68 China, uh, Chinese warplanes and 13 warships uh, crossed the Strait's midline as they uh, do these exercises and carry out sorties in response to the trip from Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. How much is this getting closer to a hot conflict where you have two nations kind of stumbling into one, especially given the fact that Joe Biden is getting increasingly accused of taking too soft of a line on some of the autocrats, whether it's Xi Jinping or whether we're talking about Vladimir Putin? Well, Lisa, that's the huge concern right now, that we're going to see things actually escalate to attention, where we're going to start seeing more and more aggressive military action. The White House is trying to prevent that. That was part of the meeting yesterday with the Chinese ambassador. It was part of the reason why Biden held that call with President Xi Jinping to tell him that the U.S. does not want a change in status quo on Taiwan. It was part of the reason that the statement that Speaker Pelosi put out just minutes after her plane touched down clearly stated that they didn't want a change in the status quo. They were trying to give Pelosi the ability to go over to Taiwan to have this moment to demonstrate this unity while also trying to send uh, a bit of a, an opposite message to Beijing saying that you know nothing has changed and I think this is now the big question this was the risk that was run with this trip being taken at this time how was Beijing going to respond and I think this is something just everyone in Washington is going to be watching very very carefully to see how the dynamic between Washington and Beijing play out over the next several days and weeks. Emily, thank you. Awesome as always. Emily Wilkins there down in Washington, D.C. We've got to talk about this gas price story. How many days was it now, Lisa, that we're down? How 51. many days? 51, 51 consecutive days. Consecutive days. Yeah. Since the middle of June. Yeah. So June 13th, we topped at north of $5 a gallon <clears throat> on average in America. We've come all the way down to something like four. What's interesting about that date, June 13th, is that bond yields topped on June 14th and equities bottomed two days after that, Tom. And that's been the dare I say, disinflationary story in the commodity spectrum, well, Tom, <clears throat> complex over the last month or so. And that may be the sharp divide between us and Europe as well. I just did a moving average study of Netherlands gas. And yeah, it's down two days in a row from painful highs. But the moving average of European gas, natural gas, is totally different than the song and dance in America. Just to keep going back to the relative story, Tom, for this White House, They've got a better story to tell, relatively yeah, speaking, absolutely. to two months ago. Lisa, dare I say a month ago, given the latest talks with Senator Sinema and the direction of travel on that particular bill. They have a win on gas prices. They have a win on the legislative front. How do they parlay this into a win when you're talking about a labor market? And that's why I actually am really interested in to hear what Marty Walsh has to say. How are they going to dovetail a softening labor market that they need to see to soften inflation with a strong economy that they need to get reelected because it always, always is about the economy. And right now, people want to have some optimism in the people that they elect. At four dollars a gallon, I'm not ready to call it a win just yet, but certainly getting better, you Lisa. Know, winning can we say that doing better <laughs> how much something is it like that how much is it the direction of travel though even more than the actual price because people have seen it come down so dramatically and remember that feeling when you see yeah. those prices just climbing and climbing and climbing it's demoralizing sure if you see the bill increasing and if you see it decreasing it gives you a little wind is the calendar on their side tom that's what we've been talking about all year is the calendar on their side I'd look to the November meeting. I still think it's just a huge... Nobody's talking about it. It's even bigger zone. than September. Absolutely. Futures right now, unchanged on the S&P. Going into payrolls, one hour and five minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Good morning on this Payrolls Friday morning. 
Good morning. Here is your morning price action. Futures unchanged on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, essentially unchanged too, down about a tenth of 1%. Not unchanged from the June lows. What a rally it's been. Up by more than 19%, call it 20% higher on the Nasdaq 100, more than 13% higher on the S&P 500. That's the equity rip. You know that story well. This has happened even as the Fed has pushed back. We talked about the move at the front end of the yield curve. Let's talk about it again. Twos, tens and thirties. Yields up by 17 or 18 basis points on the two-year. We are responding in the way we anticipated to the Fed speak that we anticipated, which was some pushback after what we heard from Chairman Powell last week. Some pushback, essentially the bottom line, the conclusion, we have more work to do. So a bit more weight into the front end of the yield curve and yet still an equity market rally. Lisa's talked a lot about that. If I told you we'd move higher on the week by 17 or 18 basis points, would you say we'd have a third straight week of gains in store on the Nasdaq? Well, that's what we've got. In the FX market, it's always about the relative story, Tom. In the UK, they're facing down 13% inflation in their future. The prospect I, of a recession starting year-end and running through the whole yeah. of 2023. Europe, they face an energy crisis potentially at the back end of this year in the winter. Tom, is the US going to be a better story through next year and maybe well, even beyond? Particularly for our American audience and the focus on what we're going to see in one hour, I would suggest, John, that what we saw yesterday in Britain was absolutely historic going back to John Major in 1992, and it follows on through the weekend. I know there's a political overlay as well. Uh, is Richmond getting ready to play Crystal Palace? But what really matters, John, is the uproar in America is being missed in the United Kingdom. I wish we could have had a shot at Lisa's face then, Tom, when you said Richmond Palace all over again. And I imagine most of the UK feel the same way when they hear you say that. Tom, it's Palace versus Arsenal later. Oh. They don't play Richmond. That's not a thing. Okay. But you know that. Sorry. And I know Excuse you know me. that. Euro Excuse dollar me. right now, 102.36. Tom thinks Ted Lasso is real. That's your <laughs> cross asset price action. <laughs> Let's get you some single names and say good morning to Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hey, I'm really looking at some of the individual stories, which are fascinating and show a very motley picture of the U.S. consumer and the U.S. economy. DoorDash, people like to order food. I know Tom talks a lot about it, and they are doing it more and more, despite all of the concerns about inflation. So people thought that maybe there'd be a cutback. There was not. They beat ex expectations, those shares, uh, surging up more than 10% ahead of the open. Lyft, reporting record revenues, people getting back to pre-pandemic levels in terms of getting to this ride-sharing company and, uh, and, and, and getting rides. Those shares up more than 8%. And Carvana, it wasn't as bad as feared. And just to give you some perspective, so this looks like a big pop, up 8% uh, ahead of the market <laughs> open. Oh my goodness, such a big move. Well, those shares are down almost 90% year to date. So it gives you a sense mm -hmm. of just how far expectations have What's fallen and Carvana? how low the bar is to jump over, Tom. What's Carvana? It's an online platform to sell cars. And so it was really hit hard with this okay. move back from cars and this uh, expectation that you need to actually generate a significant amount of cash flow, right. but the results were not as bad as fear. Okay. If you take a look at the less <laughs> well-performing stocks ahead of the open, a lot of it has to do with advertising. AMC, Paramount, and Zillow, all different sides of the same story. There are not the advertisers. There is not the same kind of appetite for media that there has been. We have seen an absolute decimation in a lot of the big media stocks, and you're seeing that now. AMC down almost 9% ahead of the open. Paramount, interesting. It actually beat some of the revenues, uh, beat expectations on that top line. Advertising revenue, though, a soft spot. And Zillow, the housing market <laughs> online uh, platform, also really getting a hit by advertising. Not necessarily just the housing market, but they get their revenue revenues based on the advertising about a housing market that is rolling over in a massive way. And you can see those shares down more than 8%, uh, Tom, ahead of the open. Lisa, thanks so much. We dive into Jobs Day right now and are thrilled to do it with the chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, Ellen Zettner, joining us uh, with Bloomberg today. Thank you so much for joining uh, Bloomberg. I, I want to go back to when I first met you and your analysis of the American consumer was world class years and uh, years ago. How does the American consumer fold into this morning's jobs report. So labor income is the primary driver uh, of consumption. I mean, that's what helps households spend, even more so than excess savings uh, or uh, credit availability. It's, mm -hmm. it's labor income. Um, and so we want to see that participation rate is up in today's report. We want to see how broad-based that is. We've had some declines recently. That's pretty worrisome. Um, but I think that continues to be one of the areas of real focus um, in this jobs report. I think the job gains are still going to be robust. They're going to be slower. 
Um, you know, I think consensus looking for 250. We're at 300. Um, but anywhere in the 200s, that's still really okay, strong. This is job really creation. important. Let's go back to what normal was. And there was a time where we modeled 150,000 non farm payrolls, is the run rate of this nation. Adjust that now. What is the run rate beneath the elevation that we still see of a reemployed post pandemic America? So if we think about, you know, how many jobs do we need to create to keep the unemployment rate steady? Um, and it's about 90,000 by our estimates, uh, which means we're running a very hot labor market exactly. by 200, 300,000, 400,000 jobs a month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're so focused on the jobs report because, of course, it's the engine of the economy. And when you've got recession fears and, and angst that is so high right now, a very weak jobs report um, would really rattle folks. But I tell you what would rattle me is if we don't see a slowdown in jobs, if we don't see that slack in the labor market start to return, because right. then the Fed would have to do even more. Then take us back to the waller Summers debate. And I don't want to wax philosophical here. We're 20, uh, 55 minutes away. It's not time for theory. But I do want to suggest there was this halcyon day before 2000 when it was truly a fully employed America. And Jeff Sachs and others have said, that's gone. Are we looking at this whole song and dance wrong and that it's an America that is employable and there's a whole nother America that is not? Yeah, so I think when the dust settles, and who knows when that is, this is going to be a social economic debate for quite a long time because we are very focused on labor force participation rates picking up. And those will reach pre-pandemic levels. But and then what? I think what will not reach pre-pandemic levels is probably the employment to population ratio, because you will have a large chunk of the population that will just be unemployable. I, I tell you what, I've been learning more and more about long COVID and not just uh, long COVID that you have symptoms for more than three months, uh, debilitating long COVID. And we've been studying the UK because they have a nice national database for it, trying to apply that to the U.S., mm -hmm. we might have a real problem there uh, where a good chunk of folks are just simply going to be unemployable. And Ellen, this is something people have pointed to, to the mystery of the lack of recovery in the participation rate that we have seen. I want to go to Tom Porcelli's point where he said, why is it bad to see high wage gains? Why is it bad to see wage gains that are still lagging so far behind inflation at a time when we have seen the middle class really crimped and crimped disproportionately? What's your response? Yeah, so I think that's that's absolutely right. From an economist perspective, we love high wage gains because it means you can have strong aggregate income, uh, again, to support the consumer uh, spending. And right now, these strong wage gains are being outpaced still by inflation. So real wage gains are negative. Um, that's a very different view from, say, strategists that are looking at it from a company perspective where margins might be crimped because of high wage gains. But from an economic perspective, it's absolutely essential. So, Ellen, why is it then negative, right? I mean, at a certain point, why shouldn't the Fed welcome the wage gains and target other areas? In other words, can they point to some of the softening and in inflation uh, inputs that we're seeing, whether it's oil, whether it's food, whether it's, uh, you know, what Elon Musk was talking about with the components uh, for the cars that he's making? Why can't they point to that and say the wage gains is the good part? So I think they will point to that. I, I don't think it's the time yet. I mean, I think they have to acknowledge that, yes, headline inflation will be falling, primarily because energy prices coming down. But core inflation that really represents how tight the domestic economy is, is still rising. And don't think we've reached the peak in that. Uh, and so um, I think that um, where their perspective is, 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 the, is the strong wage gains going to lead to a wage price spiral. And there, there's absolutely no reason to expect that because ex inflation expectations, which are an essential element of a wage price spiral, um, are just not there in this cycle. Um, and we've not seen it emerge despite the strong wage gains. So they're watchful. Um, but even there, they acknowledge that real wage gains are negative. Now, with inflation coming down... Um, and our forecast by the middle of next year, real wage gains will turn positive. So it's almost like you'll breathe some more life into the economy at a time when the Fed has done its maximum amount of tightening. Um, and we do think that that underpins our expectation that the Fed can achieve a soft landing uh, next year. What is that soft landing to you, Ellen? Does that include a shallow recession? What is it? Well, you know, soft landing at its basic 
form, right, is just simply do you end up with a sharp growth slowdown, but growth is still positive, or do you drop into negative territory, into recession territory? Now, for markets, sharp slowdown versus shallow recession, you're going to trade it the same. Um, but economists can march around and say, I was right, soft landing rather than hard landing, and the Fed can pat themselves on the on the back. Um, the data that feeds into these recession probability models and, and you know, has it cannot understand the nuance uh, between is the data pointing to a slowdown or is the data pointing to a recession. So that's why you get such big recession fears. But the Fed is trying to engineer all of this. And we can see areas of the economy where they're very successful and areas where they need to continue. We're not having enough pinch yet in the labor market, for instance. Um, and we're hoping to see some of those elements today that show that we're continuing to slow labor market uh uh, gains. Um, but I think a soft landing is absolutely possible here. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I've been having conversation with with investors is really the focus on, well, what about negative job gains? It, that's recession, negative job gains. I can point back to four times since the 1970s that we've had sharp slowdown in negative job gains and still uh, came out of that and had an expansion for a few more years. There you go. Ellen, awesome to have you here in New York City with us in the studio. Thanks for being with us. Ellen Zetner there of Morgan Stanley. As we count you down to payrolls, the data, let's call it 50 minutes away. Futures unchanged on the S&P with Tom Keane, Lisa Brambitz and myself, Jonathan Farrow. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. China is lashing out at the US for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan this week. Today, Beijing announced it is imposing unspecified sanctions on Pelosi and her family. China is also halting meetings with American military leaders and cooperation with the US on drugs, climate and a number of other issues. This morning, China's ambassador to the US was summoned to the White House. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey is rejecting criticism that the central bank acted too slowly on inflation. The remarks on BBC Radio are a response to growing attacks from the UK's Conservative Party. The BOE was first amongst major central banks to raise interest rates, but it's fallen behind the US Federal Reserve in the pace of those increases. U.S. health officials have declared monkeypox a public health emergency. That is a step that will free up funding, treatments and other services to fight the virus. The U.S. leads the world with known cases, more than 6,000 of them. And South Korea has become the seventh nation to send spacecraft to the moon. The country launched its first home-developed lunar orbiter. It lifted off from Florida's Cape Canaveral on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The orbiter will travel for four and a half months before entering lunar orbit to begin its mission in December. And Facebook parent Meta Platforms has sold $10 billion in its first ever corporate bond deal. Meta had been one of the few S&P 500 companies without debt. The company's stance on borrowing money on borrowing may have shifted with the state out of its business. Meta just posted its first quarterly revenue decline. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. get inflation back to target. There's no question about that. Uh, so that's my message to, to people in the street. Now, of course, it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard, particularly for those on low incomes in this country who are much more affected by inflation, which is concentrated as it is in energy particularly. But if we don't get it under control, it will get worse and we will have to raise interest rates by more. I've used this word a few times in the last 24 hours, brutal from Governor Bailey of the Bank of England, sitting down with Francine Lacroix yesterday after that decision. Well worth a second look if you haven't seen it. 13% inflation forecast, more than. Recession from Q4 this year and through the whole of next year. And rates may have to go even higher than now. Futures unchanged on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by not even a tenth of 1%. Going into payrolls, 42 minutes away. Yields are higher by a single basis point. 270 on the 10-year. And I've said this a few times this morning too. I cannot get used to crude in the 80s after seeing well, it north of 100 for so $30, long. $30, John. 87, That's 30 to 97. 30 
Big turnaround, Tom. We're down another six tenths of one percent this morning. One twenty-four to ninety-four. I'm Brent Crude, and uh, that speaks volumes. Right now, we're going to get the math done. Julian Lee is with us, oil strategist at Bloomberg, with a brilliant uh, an X number of paragraphs on what Saudi Arabia did at OPEC Plus the other day, and we get an oil uh, update from uh, Julian Lee. Julian, I want to look at the math of your oil study and how it folds over to a liter or gallon of gas. As oil comes down. Do you just assume a liter or a gallon of gas comes down? Um, I, I don't think you can make that kind of one-to-one -one, uh, assumption, and it very much depends where in the world you are. Um, certainly, we see that, that gas prices in, in the U.S. are, are much more responsive uh, to changes in, in crude prices than they are here in Europe, for example. Mm. And that's very much a function of taxation. Um, the, the, the very high level of taxes here uh, in Europe are predominantly fixed. So <clears throat> the, the tax doesn't change as the underlying right. price of the, uh, the oil changes. And that has a dampening effect on, on <clears throat> any movement. We saw OPEC Plus. You wrote a brilliant paragraph. John Farrow cited it, I think, three times. On it was minuscule. <laughs> it was basically invisible. What is next for OPEC Plus? I think that's a very good question. I mean, you know, you, you can look at what they did earlier this week, and, and they, they agreed to add uh, 100,000 barrels a day. I mean, you, you know, they, you struggle to measure that. Um, and th there, are, you know, there are various possible reasons that they did so little. I mean, it, it could be... The, the political sway that Russia holds within the group and uh, certainly their, their post-meeting um, press release talked about um, the, the need to hold everybody together and, and unanimity, um, and that may be the best that they could get. The other big point that they made is, is that basically they have very little spare capacity. There's very little more that they can add um, and for most members, there's probably none at all. And that really does then start to raise the question of what's the point of this group? If, if they cannot any longer um, balance the market by putting in more supply when it's needed, then, you know, is their purpose then just to, to cut back as, 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 things, uh, uh, as things slow down if they do? Julian, given the supply response or lack thereof and the worries around spare capacity. I'm just looking down the contract table for crude. We're in the 70s in December 23 for whatever that's worth. What do you make of the backwardation in crude at the moment? Does that make sense to you, Julian? Well, I think, I, you know, I, I think that what people are starting to price in is, is uh, the recession that, that's being talked about very much here in the UK at the moment and, and certainly... Um, looks like happening across most of, of Europe, and whether it will uh, be the same in the U.S., we don't know. Um, certainly there seems to be, uh, at the moment anyway, a, a bit of a slowdown in, in expectations for China. And if you start factoring all that in um, and the supply growth that, that is seen from uh, a, a relatively small number of, of countries next year, but nonetheless it is supply growth, uh, then perhaps, you know, you then start to see an oversupplied market again. Julian, how much does this hinge on China never leaving zero COVID? I think that's, that's uh, a, again, a, a very good question. I mean, this zero COVID policy that China has adopted has certainly uh, held back the recovery very significantly. Um, we're seeing sort of rolling lockdown after lockdown. People are, are being uh, restricted from moving. Uh, companies aren't, aren't operating in, in the way that they would do without these restrictions. And there certainly is, I, I think, this great uncertainty around what happens in China uh, if they have a, a shift in their COVID policy. Um, and things pick up again. But I think part of the uncertainty is that China's economy is still very tied in uh, to being a supplier of goods to the rest of the world. And if the rest of the world is in recession, that has a knock-on effect again on, on China's economy. Julian, just awesome coverage this week with the team 
on OPEC Plus in that uh, meeting. The team's done a brilliant job. Just fantastic, Julian. Thank you, sir. As always, Julian Lee there on the latest. And Lisa, spot on. It's got to be one of the hardest questions to answer right now. Can you get in the mind of President Xi and tell us what the demand back picture looks like out of China? And can we get a sense of the range of potential outcomes for crude should the zero COVID be abandoned after the party congress later this year or not? I mean, is this basically the distinction between $70 or $110? I mean, how big is that spread? Pick your poison, Tom, when it comes to COVID oh, zero. For the rest of the world, at least, the supply chain kinks could work themselves out a little bit more on the one side. On the other side, you're going to have a lot more demand into that commodity market. Well, the demand dynamics is always the greatest mystery. Uh, John, it's just something learned years ago is a general statement guessing the price of oil is the most hazardous to your portfolio the hardest yes it, it just you I, i've learned it by lo enjoying losing money and it's it's just the hardest thing to do uh, tom i think a lot of people have enjoyed losing money trying to guess the crude price without a doubt it's there and you know by between now and the end of the year john i, I guess it could cut either way but just a major respect for people like edward morris at citigroup who are just saying when everybody calm down at 110, 120. Well, and then there's this added element of uncertainty that Paul Sankey was raising yesterday, where he said it's because people are driving the same number of miles, but they have much more efficient cars. How do you factor in the shift to uh, better mileage and electric vehicles? Honestly, what did you make of that? Were you well, convinced by that? I challenged it by saying, well, we're talking two years difference that we're experiencing these, you know, uh, declines in terms of gas usage in a certain peak period of time. So unless everybody got electric vehicles in those two years, it's hard to see that that would necessarily yeah. be the case. That said, there is this issue of better efficiency right now going uh, forward. John, I remember people gaming the price of oil off the shift from traditional tires to radials a million gazillion years ago. How many ago. decades ago was that, Tom? It, it, it just, you know. Good times. It it, it's supply and demand. Guess it as you can, and good luck. Futures, positive a tenth on the S&P. In the next hour, it's the payrolls report, 8.30 Eastern time, 34 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Many of us have been saying, you know, we're in a technical recession, but not a true recession because the labor market is so strong. I don't think we're pricing in the recession that's coming. I think the Fed was very, very late to this. I mean, I, I would argue that today we should be 100 basis points higher. I think what the market needs to see is more and more tightening. It's clear that, you know, the Fed is not done. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramus, and Tom Keen on radio and television. It is Jobs Day in America. An important report to us here in 29 uh, minutes. John, I'm going to go beneath the headline data and say wages, wages, wages. That's what matters this morning. It's a two-part story, Tom, a two-part story. Today's payrolls, next week is CPI, and that should set us up for a meeting in September for this Federal Reserve because you'll get another CPI report and another payrolls report then too. It's a long, long way, Tom, to that September meeting, and Jackson Hole comes somewhere in between. No forward guidance into this report. We've become data dependent. The data's there at 8.30, and the Fed will have to adjust. But, John, markets also, and we do so with curve inversion of 37 negative basis points. Tom, that's the story for me, for Lisa, for you too, this week. The Fed has pushed back in a way we thought they would. Yields have responded at the front end by 17 or 18 basis points on a two-year higher. And the equity markets kept on rallying. The Nasdaq 100 rallying for a third consecutive week, Tom. And we have ripped off that market low. I mean, really ripped off that market low, close to 20% higher since June 16th on the Nasdaq. Uh, that's been the equity surge. Maybe in this hour we'll do less of that and more of the jobs report. But, Lisa, it does fold into the fixed income space. And, frankly, that's been as dynamic as equities. Yeah, it's actually been shockingly dynamic, considering that this is the most liquid, deepest market in the world. Whipsawed, particularly at the front end, as people get more confident the Fed will come through with uh, their expected rate hikes. I am very curious to see at a half-hour time this jobs market, the reaction in markets to a good print. If you see constant wage growth, how much does this feed into the Ellen Zentner view of things? Next year, you get a roll off in some of the inflationary inputs and you get positive real wage growth that right. will fuel a soft landing. That is a fascinating point. One of the most interesting that I've heard in a long time. Jeff Rosenberg to join us from BlackRock. Randall Krosner will join us as always on Jobs Day. Important perspective from the former governor of the Fed. John, let's race through the data check here to get to Nadia. Uh, 
uh, level uh, right now. I'm going to look again. Equities churning earlier. John. Green on the screen. Nice. Muted price action, Tom. Muted. Up a tenth on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up by 0.04% in the bond so market, true. up by not even a basis point. <laughs> We're hanging tough. We're going nowhere. Going into payrolls in about 28 minutes. 269.54 on a 10-year. We talked about life south of 100 <laughs> on crude. Life south of 90. Sub 90. $88 a barrel now on WTI. Tom, we're down about four tenths of 1% on the session. The heritage of astronomy and physics in Western Massachusetts is extraordinary. At Smith College, you would never have guessed that there is McConnell Observatory. And if you're a physics major at Smith College at gunpoint in the cold of February, you have to go up on the roof and look up at the stars. Nadia Lovell joins us right now from Smith College and, of course, at UBS and Global Wealth Management as well. Nadia, I want you to look at the stars of the jobs report here in 29 minutes and cut to the chase. What's it mean for your equity market? You know, we're closely watching these job numbers. I mean, we think that if you get something in the 200 to 250 range and that is comfortable for market. We also want to see labor participation move up because that will also mean that, you know, labor supply is increasing and that could help alleviate some pressures that we're seeing in the wage side. So in order for this rally to sort of be sustained um, from a job market standpoint, you want to sort of be in that sweet spot. But we do think that what's also important to the market is next week, the CPI numbers, because obviously that's going to also defend, uh, de determine the path of the Fed going forward. Nadia, when you were studying physics, the stars were fixed in the sky. There was an order to all this. Just as you write into August here, is there an order to the equity market and to this equity rally we've seen? Or do you feel like there's almost a frenzy going on? You know, we had been expecting a bit of rally in late June coming into July, just given how extremely negative sentiment and position it had been. But quite honestly, the strength and the duration of this admittedly is a bit surprising for us. You know, of course, some short covering, some positioning, some better than fair second quarter earnings report. And this Fed pivot. I think also what's happening, Tom, is that there's some fear of missing out happening here after a brutal first quarter. But, you know, I think we can all agree that reality, the fundamentals haven't gotten any better. And I think the price that you're paying, the market, the multiple that the market is now putting on for deteriorating fundamentals just seems quite high to us. And so we think that it, it will correct again. Now, this rally could continue for a little bit longer, but we wouldn't chase it. Uh, we just think that the risk reward just isn't attractive. And that's why we're maintaining our year and price target for S&P of 3900 so, Nadia, tell me how you would use this strength to sell into. What would you sell? How would you fade this story? Yeah, you know, what we would do, we would fade the unprofitable tech companies that have re rebounded. Also, I think consumer discretionary. You know, this is a somewhat of an eclectic sector. It's very mixed. You know, two, two of the companies within the sector accounts for about 50% of the market cap. And so when they move, the sector itself will move big. But when we are seeing some cracks within the consumer, particularly on the low end consumer in the earnings season. We're seeing trade down happening. We're seeing delinquency move up. And so we think that overall consumer spending will slow and continue to shift away from goods to our services. And so these are some of the areas of the market that we would fade the rally in. But there are also other areas of the market, you know, particularly energy that has been under pressure recently that we would look to to rotate into back into here. Nadia, you specified unprofitable tech. What about the profitable tech uh, and the, the companies that have absolutely been on a tear? I'm looking at Amazon shares up 30 percent since the end of June. Same story you get in Microsoft and Apple, though, to perhaps a lesser extent in terms of the rally. Has it gone too far, especially considering that rate hikes are now being rebuilt in to the structure? I think so. And it has gone a, a little bit too far for our liking, you know, obviously due to just little bond yields. And admittedly, you know, um, earnings came in better from than some of the mega cap tech companies, you know, but valuation has moved back above longer term average. You are seeing, though, I mean, the tech companies, the major tech and tech and naval companies are signaling a slowdown. You are seeing them hiring freezes and layoff. And so it's a more challenging environment when you think that the pressure that that's going to put on advertising budget inventory is also building in some of the um, semi areas and inflation will, will weigh on discretionary spending. But I think, I think what we did heard, Lisa, during the earnings seasons is that enterprise and spending does remain strong. So we would be selective in tax. Really looks at those high-quality companies, particularly those with higher reoccurring revenue that's 
going to be more resilient in any sort of um, slowdown. And those that are less exposed to consumers. So we would need to fade the rally in the others and maintain exposure in this high area of quality. When it comes to the energy opportunities that you're looking at, how much does that hinge on a recession that doesn't come or a soft landing that doesn't dampen demand to such a degree? You know, when you look at past recessions and on oil demand, it really doesn't change all that much. You aren't seeing this real meaningful contraction in, in, in oil demand. And so this is why we continue to remain bullish on oil. And just think about in the second half of the year, when you look out, you've seen a massive pullback in oil prices. When you look out in the second half, you're going to need to rebuild the SPRs. You're also going to see additional sanction on Russian oil. And so those 3 million barrels a day are going to need to be replaced. And so we heard from OPEC this week that spare capacity remains quite limited. And so we think that this is going to put upward pressure on oil prices. And oil, we continue to believe that oil prices will get to $125 spread by year end and into next year. And that should be overall positive for commodities as well as for the energy sector. Nadia, brilliant to catch up with you on this Payrolls Friday. Thank you. Nadia Lovell there of UBS Global Wealth Management. What Nadia said about consumer discretionary is so, so important. I've talked about this rally off the lows off the middle of June. We're up about 25% for that industry group. As she said, two names, know what you own, two names make up that industry group, 50% of it. One is Amazon, a 30% of that industry group on the yeah, S&P. Tesla's at 19%. And for yeah. anyone, Tom, who's looked at the performance of Amazon off the June low, for them, their low was I, I, June 14th. We're almost 40% higher since then on that single yeah. name alone, Tom. Uh, this is so important, John. I, I am overcome by the childish homogeneity of analysis of equity markets. The equity, you know, John and I go back and forth, folks, on the Dow and the S&P 500. The Dow is an artifact that is a benchmark. John, we're down 7,000 Dow points, and we've come back up 2,800. But the bottom line is it, it doesn't evoke the 20 or 30 stocks doing all the heavy lifting. And Amazon and Tesla, Lisa, does a lot of heavy lifting yeah. for consumer discretionary on the S&P. Yeah, and Amazon has so much cash that they just uh, made a purchase. They are purchasing Roomba, uh, which is the vacuum cleaner that a lot of people have around their houses. I find this fascinating because, first of all, people have one, been wondering when they're going to start making acquisitions, but it also raises other issues of the tech dominance that's allowing them to do everything in your home and track it. And so this send is messages the robot back. vacuum cleaner? Yes, correct. Okay. How much are they? I don't know. I don't have a Roomba. Tom I don't has have a Roomba. One. I'm, I'm asking well, if someone can tell me how much are they. No, no, I, I, I'll, I'll look I, I don't remember. The, you know, the, the accountant gets them for us, but, but, but the, the, there's three or four of them, and they've gotten better. They've gotten quiet. Vet Bill loves it now, actually. At first, there were some real problems. The dog dogs, was scared of it. Dogs were scared of it. But right now, Vet Bill loves his Roomba. But, you know, the bottom line here, John, is this is a company that tanks 70 percent, and Amazon's picking it up off the bottom off what appears you know, an amateur glance to be a dreadful earnings report. John, how much of this are we going to see in some form of growth recession or true recession where the haves take out the have-nots? What's wrong with just doing a bit of vacuum cleaning? Hey, Lisa, to your point, we're starting to see a little bit more corporate activity this week on both the equity side and the debt side. It had been completely shut down during a lot of the volatility and the massive part of the sell-off, and now you're seeing it pick back up again. Just for your information, a Roomba can go from $250 to $1,000. How my can it be $1,000? That's ridiculous. Well, I, mean, I think that it's some kind of set. I don't know. The theory, Alex Webb is saying, that it can map your house out so oh, that it can... Oh, stop it. No. No, no. I mean, it's, oh, it's no. just this Roomba, whole thing the of your guys, 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 guys. privacy. No. I know. This is no. the reason why you don't know John, about Roomba. the no. $1,000 Roomba's got a bucket up top with milk bone biscuits in it, which is how you get the dog to... You know, Tom, have you seen the Balenciaga trash bag for $1,790 no, no, $1, for this? Where do you find this Balenciaga stuff? drives me nuts. Did you buy two? I didn't get any. I think it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. And someone just tweeted, the Fed should hike 1,500 basis points. And they tweeted that story of Balenciaga. <laughs> Futures up a tenth on the S&P. Payroll is just around the corner. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. More fallout today from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. China has imposed unspecified sanctions on Pelosi and her family. Beijing also cut off talks with the U.S. on defense and drugs. And it continued its most provocative military drills in decades, sending warplanes and ships across the median line in the Taiwan Strait. Meanwhile, China's ambassador to the U.S. was summoned to the White House to receive an official protest.
There are signs that conditions in the U.S. labor market are easing. The July jobs report is out just a few minutes. From now, it's forecast to show that the U.S. US added 250,000 jobs, whilst the unemployment rate held close to a 50-year low. Last week, applications for state unemployment insurance rose slightly and was near the highest level since November. Democrats have agreed on a revised version of their tax and climate bill. They will drop a provision that would have narrowed a tax break for carried interest. They also altered a minimum tax on corporations and added a new 1% tax on stock buybacks. A pivotal vote in the 50-50 Senate, Democrat Kristen Sinema says she'll back the revised plan. And Amazon has agreed to buy iRobot, the company that makes robots that vacuum and wash floors. Its devices also are used to perform a battlefield re reconnaissance and bomb disposal. The deal is valued at about $1.7 billion, including debt. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. keeps on sort of, you know, hanging their hat on the idea that there's, you know, people can find a job really quick. Job openings are not the thing we're supposed to be hanging our hat on. It's a massive lagging indicator. They fall in earnest in the midst of a recession. That was Tom Paul Sutley there of RBC going into the payrolls report in around about 13 minutes from New York City this morning. Good morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Abramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Futures shaping up as follows. Up a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, totally unchanged almost. Likewise in the bond market, Tom, 269.54, crude 88. Not much price action out there. Got into payrolls, 12 minutes away. I'm just turn there. I would say a little bit of lift in the equity market gets my attention. And the VIX under a 22 really shows the extent of how we've moved. Right now, we dive into the jobs report. Of course, Michael McKee will join and Jeffrey Rosenberg as well. But we start strong with the former governor of the Federal Reserve System, Randall Krosner, joins us of Brown University and, of course, now at the Booth School and the University of Chicago and hugely affected by the work and heritage of George Stigler. Randy Krosner, Professor Stigler basically invented this so-called phrase, price theory, the dynamics of price within any system. Do we understand the price theory of wages? Do we understand in our system how wages actually are determined? Uh, we have uh, some uh, knowledge of that, but I don't think our knowledge is perfect. Um, and obviously, one of the key things that the Fed is focusing on is that uh, wage dynamic, how much is being determined by people's expectations about inflation, what determines those expectations, what anchors them, what, an what, I what unanchors them, those are really key issues. Is the Fed flying blind right now, given the shocks of the system coming out of a pandemic? Do they have a theory or are they making it up in a data-dependent way as they go? Well, I think they have uh, theoretical structures. I wouldn't say flying blind, that's a little bit, uh, a little bit too far. Um, but um, as I think they have admitted, uh, this is not your typical job market. This is not your typical um, recovery and, uh, uh, and uh, not your typical uh, inflation. So, um, so they are, are not certain about exactly the, uh, the wage dynamic and the price dynamic, but they know one thing, that if they significantly increase interest rates, they reduce demand, that's going to put uh, less pressure on prices. Michael Schumacher came in and he was talking about what the Fed is looking for uh, in terms of their communications. And he was saying basically they're, they're just not getting into what they need to be saying, which is they need to be raising rates and they need to give that conviction to markets. Do you think that they are doing a bad job in messaging with particular focus on Fed Chair Jay Powell? Well, no, I don't think that's, uh, I think that's a bit unfair. I think people didn't listen carefully to what Jay said at the press conference. And I think a number of Fed speakers came out afterwards to, to try to clarify that. He did say that he was going more meeting to meeting, but he also made it very clear what the direction was. Uh, numerous times in the press conference, he said, well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what number we're going to be at, but why don't you look at the most recent projections we had, which said we'll get to about three and a half by the end of the year. That sounds pretty good to me. So he's not giving a meeting by meeting number, but he's giving a direction. And I think the other Fed speakers have been pretty consistent in that. 
There is a fear that the Fed goes into the stop and go dynamic that we've been talking about, Mohamed Alarian. John was pointing that out earlier, that they're going to make the same mistake that they made in the 70s and uh, stop raising rates too soon, even lower them, and then another bout of inflation will take over and cause them to have to move again. How are the dynamics of inflation similar to the 1970s that could cause that versus different, making that not as big of a risk? Well, one, I think because of that experience, the Fed is, is well aware of that. And I think you can see from what Jay has said and what from the other Fed speakers have said that this the market is much too sanguine about them um, pulling rates back down early next year. Now, the Fed speakers have changed some of those market expectations because I think the Fed realizes that it's not like you just put the interest rate up to three and a half, four percent for a month or two, inflation comes down and everything's fine. You've really got to make sure that inflation and inflation expectations have come down and are out of the system. And that's going to mean keeping interest rates, I would uh, estimate, around 4% for a while. That's not going to be something that they just barely get to and then, uh, and then retrace. Randy, isn't that forward guidance? It's, uh, I mean, it's giving some sort of notion of uh, what the Fed reaction function is, whether you call it forward guidance or not. I think also there's a confusion about the meeting by meeting guidance of like, well, next meeting we're going to do 75. Yeah. Jay very clearly said, we're not going to say that. He didn't say we're not going to give you some sort of broad direction. OK, Randy Krosner, do you like that, Lisa? There is no more short term forward guidance. There is medium term yeah. forward guidance. I'm does, just that, still, does that add up? <laughs> I'm just still thinking about 4% for quite a long time, that that will be where the Fed funds rate, that that was Randy Crosser's call. And that's yeah. that's a really uh, significant change from market expectations. What would cause a shift away from that? And what do you have to see in the labor market to justify that kind of move that really is not priced in? What is quite a long time? I mentioned that note from Adam Ruskin over at Deutsche Bank. Over the last three Fed tightening cycles, the time spent at peak, seven months in the year 2000, 12 months in 06, 07, six months in 2018, 19. Just something to think about. We are about seven minutes away from the payrolls data. Randy's going to come back in a moment and break that down for us. Mike McKee will as well. Future's up about a tenth of 1%. Mike McKee, what are you looking for when this one drops? Well, I think the interesting thing is going to be the divergence that we've seen in between equities and bonds may get highlighted by whatever happens today. If we get a bang on number, everybody trades as the way they did. But if it's really weak or really strong, that will cause people to start thinking about uh, recession or the fact that the Fed's going to have to go more. So it'd be interesting to see what the headline number is today. And then you'll have this fork in the road. And as Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Let's talk about that fork in the road. Mike, when are you expecting to see the deceleration? And I don't mean the step down from 300 to 200. We could see that this morning. I mean the real weakness that people are looking for. Well, it's probably going to be another month or two, uh, maybe two, because these are backward-looking numbers. And the problem is we never get a contraction, or have not in the past, gotten a contraction in jobs created until after a recession has started. So if you believe the recession's underway, you could see right. this happening. But uh, economists have never forecast in advance uh, mm -hmm. decline in jobs. So uh, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes to get there, if we get there. Yeah, very quickly, Mike, and I love the paper Yogi Berra gave at Jackson Hole there a number of years ago. <laughs> Mike, I want to talk about this canard of a fully employed America. It's baloney. Are we fully employed? Well, the only way you can argue that is to talk about the math of it, because otherwise it's subjective. But the math of it is, yes, we're uh, at, at a rate of unemployment where everybody who wants a job basically can find a job. There's always going to be people in between jobs. So, yeah, the Fed has a, a, a pretty good view on that, I think, and it's hard to disagree. Um, the one thing about Jackson Hole that Yogi Berra also said was nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> We'll be going there, Mike, at the end of the month. Looking forward to going there with you. Mike McKee is going to be standing by to break this down. Mike McKee alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. When this one drops, we'll catch up with Mike McKee. We'll get the thoughts of Randy Krosner, formerly of the Federal Reserve, to give us his thoughts on what this means for the Fed. And then the market response, too, with Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock. All of that coming up in about five minutes' time. Going into this payroll to report, futures essentially unchanged, up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.05%. Yields going nowhere at 269.36. Yields like likely coming somewhere in about four minutes. Your estimate 250k. The number up next.
your payroll data is 10 seconds away. Going into this data point, futures up by two tenths of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up a little more than a tenth of 1% at 8.30 Eastern time. Hopefully with the payrolls report, let's get over to Mike McKee. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Here we go. And this oh, is quite oh. a surprise. Oh, my, as oh Dick my. Enberg would say. 528,000 jobs created or restored. And interestingly enough, that takes us back <laughs> to where we were when the pandemic started, that level. Uh, the change in pi private payrolls, 471,000. The change in manufacturing payrolls, uh, up 30,000. Unemployment falls to 3.5%. I'll look into the reasons for that. And the average hourly earnings is interesting. It is up half a percent. That's more than anticipated. So we go back up again after having fallen in the previous months to 5.2%. Labor force participation rate drops a 10th, 62.1%. Uh, the prior month, June, which was 372, now revised up to 398. So a very strong payrolls report for the month of July that belies everybody's thoughts. Uh, and I would imagine, John, you're seeing some movement in the bond market. You think? Some big moves, Mike. Up 14 basis points to the front end on a two-year. The 10-year yield up about eight or nine basis points. Two's tens briefly, negative 40 basis points. That's your bond market reaction. Guess where stocks are? The lower, down by seven tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by one full percentage point off the back of this. So yields up, stocks down, dollar stronger. Euro dollar, negative seven tenths of 1%. 176 TK just wow 528 we were looking for 250 in the previous number close to 400k revised higher that's a big number and this is a big move and the revisions are there as well we're still waiting to get that data and we'll get it here at any uh, moment I, Michael McKee I look at the data and you're going to be digesting this over the hours as well would you explain how people smart like you get this so wrong I mean within the dispersion <laughs> of the economic survey just for mere mortals out there on radio and TV why do we get this report so wrong? Uh, in this case, you'd look at the contributing data, the data points that tell you something about employment, and you try to figure out from there uh, where it may end up. And you look at past history. Uh, the past history is that the uh, July numbers have un underperformed the forecast since 2017 until this yeah. year. And uh, you have models in terms of uh, what you know about various industries. <clears throat> and it's really hard. And it's now even harder given the fact that uh, we're coming out of the pandemic and we don't know uh, what's I going agree on. with the pandemic issue. And folks, to give you the real world here, I'm right now on the old HP-12C, Lisa. I'm doing a three-month moving average. The three-month moving average with revisions is a small 437,000 jobs, Lisa, over the last 90 yeah. days. That is a wow statistic. It is a labor market boom, and it's not just the headline number. Let's just go over some of these numbers. The average hourly earnings revised upward in the prior month, and same, uh, it did not go down. It stayed at the same level of 5.2%, and it comes as the participation rate continues to fall. Mike, what do you make of this? How does this sort of signal the tightness or the looseness of a market that the Fed is trying to gauge out and hinging any pivot on? Well, the funny thing is, is uh, given the hiring levels, we saw a decline in the labor force of 63,000 jobs and then gained 179,000 in the household survey while unemployment fell by 242,000. Interestingly, in June, we had seen a 353,000 uh, number of people drop out of the labor force. So the labor force is continuing to shrink, which is why we're seeing the participation rate down. Uh, but uh, 315,000 jobs in June were lost, according to the household survey. Now we get 179,000 back and a big drop in unemployment. So those who are looking for work are finding work. Uh, and it looks like companies have not yet given up the ghost on hiring, even though the forecasts have been ugly. Mike McKee, thank you. TK, that recession talk, for now at least, just got a freezing cold shower <clears throat> from that labor market report. Yes, I think that's true. And also it adjusts what we will see September 1. As you mentioned earlier, John, we've got other reports to dash to before that next meeting. Let us get a briefing from someone who has sat at the desk in the Eccles building. Randall Krosner continues with us, a former Fed uh, governor at Booth School, Chicago. Randy, how does this change the calculus 
for the Federal Open Market Committee? I think it's really clear that they are on a path to continue to raise those rates. Um, certainly, 75 basis points will be on the table for the uh, uh, for the next meeting. Uh, the thing is not only the strength of the labor market, but it is also uh, the uh, uh, the significant increase in wages, uh, higher than expected, upward revisions. Um, the Fed really worries about inflation expectation becoming entrenched. They're really hoping that inflation is going to be coming down below 5% fairly soon. But if people are still demanding 5% wage increases, that gets them into a lot of difficulty. And so that's why they're going to continue to move. I think this means that they'll, they'll certainly be in the fours by early next year. And as I said before, I think it's going to be there for a while. And exactly as Jonathan had said, when the Fed moves the rates up, it's not that they just pivot and pull them back down. They typically keep them up for a while because they really want to stamp inflation inflation expectations out of the system. Randy, someone's got to ask this question. Does this pass the smell test for you, a number this big? I mean, there can be always revisions. You never want to put too much emphasis on any one month, but you got an upward revision last month. You have a strong number this month. Um, the Fed is not going to overreact to any one number. But, you know, the upward revisions to, um, uh, that, that came last month with this will certainly embolden them to, uh, to move uh, expeditiously, as they have said. And I think they're going to get at least, to, um, I think it's going to be very close to four by the end of the year. By the end of the year, Randy, can you talk a little bit about the path? You did mention earlier that you expect them to go to 4% for the Fed funds rate and stay there for a while. How long is that while and what will determine that length? So it's going to depend a lot on uh, these these are statistics that we're, that we're getting. What's going to be happening in the labor market? What's going to be happening to to wages? And um, you know, right now we're not seeing the economy going over a cliff. And this is exactly the time that the Fed needs to be moving quickly. Um, the the economy hasn't sputtered yet, so they uh, they need to move. But also, they haven't gotten the political pressure on them yet, uh, because the unemployment rate is at near record lows. So this is the time to be raising rates to try to stamp the uh, inflation expectations and inflation out of the system. Randy, you're going to throw me out of the classroom, but I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to raise my snarky arm and say, Professor Krosner, where's the neutral rate? And I say that with great respect, because within all the back and forth of all our guests in that, it's when does this become painful, which means through the neutral rate. Where's the neutral rate, Professor? I always knew you were the troublemaker in the back of the class, um, and, uh, and you continue to be. That's exactly, that's a very important question, and one where um, the consensus of the Fed, uh, what they say is around two and a half, so roughly where they are, but that's two and a half when they think of inflation being down at 2% in the long run. In the short run, when inflation is still very, very high, um, you still have a very a dramatically negative inflation adjusted rate. So two and a half is not neutral right now. In the long run, it might be neutral, but it's still quite expansionary when inflation is, um, you know, is, well, depending so on are your you, measures. So are, are you giving up I've the been, Chicago been, school and joining Adam Posen with a 3% inflation level? Is that really what we're talking about here? Is we need to adjust the neutral rate higher? No, no, no. I'm not saying that the, the goal should change from, from 2%. And I'm not saying that, uh, that, that, in the long run, they're not. Um, I think they're right about the, or it seems reasonable that they are in a reasonable range for the for the long run. But in the short run, you can't say that two and a half percent is neutral when inflation is eight percent, and uh, so you have a you know very significantly negative real rate. So it's there's sort of a long run versus short run kind of thing. Hey Randy, awesome to catch up, Randy Krosner there, with the latest reaction to this payrolls report, and it really is a wow payrolls report. The headline number 528k, the median estimate 250, the previous number revised half from 372 to 398 and everywhere you look, unemployment lower to 3.5% down from 3.6, average hourly earnings year over year 5.2% month on month 0.5%, both of those better than expected and this is how the market responds to it. Lisa said it, good news Bad news for stocks. We're down seven tenths on the S&P. I, I thought we'd be down on much the Nasdaq. More, John. We're down nine tenths of one percent. And Tom, we'd be down way much more. Given what we're seeing in the bond market, mm, yeah, I can imagine why you think that. Up seventeen yeah. basis points on a two-year, on a ten-year, up ten or eleven. That means two's tens. The difference yeah. between the two, negative forty-one basis points. Let me just get to FX, Tom. Please. Euro dollar, 
down six tenths of one percent. Some dollar strength out there now, 101.82. And I think the take from Connor Sen over at Bloomberg Opinion out on Twitter Please. right now is something we all need to think about. You don't go from 300 to 500K monthly prints to negative prints in six months. If you're worried about a job loss recession, you've got to kick that view to 2023. Now, Tom, if Connor's right, then I wonder what that means for how far Fed funds goes. And I'd throw in Larry Summers, which essentially is what Randy was talking about there. Larry Summers said on Wall Street Week with David Weston last week, the idea that we're at neutral with inflation where it is right now, and Tom, I'd add in where the labor market is right now. What did he say, Lisa, to be diplomatic, to be blunt? It was absurd. Yeah, it was indefensible. That was the word he used. Tom, I'd have to say this morning, at least, it sounds absurd. And I would suggest that Governor Krosner there was being delicate with his former, you know, his former public uh, effort of, of being delicate about 2 percent, moving out to Posen's 3 percent or where maybe where Summers is, which is even a higher statistic. John, before we get to Jeff Rosenberg, we have to make the call of the summer, which is Priya Misra TD Securities, as the curve inversion plunges between a negative 40 to a negative 43 basis points as well. I'm sorry. John, it's my call of the summer. The six basis points deeper. Can write it down. Yeah. Another six or seven. Tom, Absolutely. I'm going to run. I'm going to catch up with Rick Reader of BlackRock in the next hour. Mohammed al You're leaving us? Mike Collins of P. Jim. Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital. And we're here from the White House too. Secretary Walsh coming up, Tom. We said earlier on this morning, the story they've got to tell is getting just a little bit better. I imagine they'll lean a little bit more heavily towards the labor <laughs> I, market uh, report today and maybe away from the GDP report of the other week. And futures negative 32 here now, a little bit of deterioration there in the last number of minutes. To make sense of this stunning report, Jeffrey Rosenberg joins us, portfolio manager of the Systematic Multi-Strategy Fund at BlackRock. Jeff Rosenberg, let me cut to the chase. How do you do multi-strategy with such a shock? It is a bit of a surprise. Clearly, you guys have hit it uh, on the head with, uh, you know, good news being being bad news. And, and it's surprisingly strong. And it's a reminder of just, you know, how strong the economy is. We're expecting an eventual slowdown, uh, but it's not here yet. And uh, Lisa and I were talking about this uh, ahead of time. You know, what does the market do? On a, on a big upside surprise. And so the narrative going in here from the FOMC was the Powell pivot, and this is the payroll pushback. And the pushback is they're not going to be able to pivot as aggressively as the market was expecting post that FOMC. And that's what you're seeing with that yield curve flattening and the big increase in the front end of the rates. Right. And then on risky assets and equities, you know, they don't like that because they like, you know, the end of the Fed right. tightening. And as Randy Krosner was was talking about, if inflation doesn't come down, we are nowhere near neutral. And so you've got a lot more Fed hikes if you don't have that inflation coming down. Jeff, I've got a bunch of dweeby bond questions for you, but I think it's important that a lot, large population of our radio and TV audience worldwide don't have fancy financial degrees. And they're asking What's wrong with generating 556,000 jobs with the revision? Why is so much good jobs formation a bad thing? I just don't get that. Yeah, well, it's, it's, about, it's about overheating and it's about inflation. And one of the challenges that you have uh, is in this report, you, you see a lot of signs of that wage inflation inflation and the wage price spiral, uh, that is, is really the bigger risk here, that you, you transition from COVID, supply side disruptions, transitory, to something that's much more persistent. And the risk is that inflation hurts everyone. And if you don't snub it out early, the pain that has to happen later is much, much greater. And so that's why Good news is bad news because for financial markets, it means the Fed is going to have to do a lot more and is going to have to do that sooner. Tightening financial conditions to rein in the demand side is the only tool they have to address this inflation concern. So, Jeff, we were talking uh, before we got these numbers that the Powell pivot would turn into the payroll pushback, which is exactly what we're seeing. And that was your expectation just based on how uh, lopsided the markets have gotten in their belief of the pivot. How much have we unwound of that? How much more do we have to go? And I say this as we look, yes, at NASDAQ futures down about a percent and going lower, but still well off the lows after surging over the past few weeks. 
Well, there's a, there's a narrow reaction to today, and then there's a, a longer run issue. The narrow reaction is, as I looked at it last, about 17 basis points. You know, you're, you're taking back, you know, a little bit less than 25 that you uh, priced out following the FOMC and the Powell pivot. Uh, but the bigger issue is really what Randy's talking about and what Summers is talking about, that, you know, to say that, that we're at neutral, uh, we're at 2.5 percent, is 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 a conflation. It's the difference between the long run neutral, which is really what he was talking about, and the issue of the short run. And and this is the issue we're going to be talking about for the next six to nine months, which is we're past peak inflation. We're going to see inflation decline. But to what level? Because the forecast in the Fed to say that they're at neutral, as Randy was just saying, is that's a 2 percent inflation rate. If you don't get to that 2 percent inflation rate, say you get to a higher inflation rate of, say, 3 percent. Well, what it means is that you're nowhere near your long term neutral and the whole bond market expectations in terms of where rates settle in have to reprice because what we're pricing right now is a 2 percent inflation, a two and a half percent long term neutral. And that's all conditional on the realization of that 2 percent inflation rate. Jeff, this is a sea of uncertainty, and we're getting little nodes that might point to a direction of travel. Where is your conviction right now as you tweak your portfolio, as you try to understand where the risks are mispriced in markets? Yeah, you know, you know we're a little bit uh, skeptical of the, of the rally that we've seen in risky assets. Uh, we're still concerned that you, you have uh, a both a shock in terms of inflation, what we're talking about here today in terms of what the Fed has to do in front of that, tightening financial conditions, not being conducive for risky assets. Uh, so we've been pulling back from our risky asset position. We didn't add uh, in, in the rally that we saw in, in July. It's important to recognize that when you're in bear markets, they don't go straight down. They have ratchets. They have bear market rallies. That's what most people are characterizing the last uh, up move here. That's a fairly consensus. We're a little concerned that, that we're in the consensus camp there, but we think all the data is pointing to still considerable challenges to the risky asset profile uh, going forward here. So it's a little bit more cautious view what, on what, risky assets. What about your portfolio of cash? I know that BlackRock has been adjusting its cash and holding a higher than uh, usual level of it. How have you maneuvered in that space? Yeah, you know, I mean, every portfolio and portfolio management team runs, you know, their own portfolios. In our uh, fund, uh, as Tom introduced at the beginning, you know, we have run higher cash levels. Uh, it's it's a way to to reduce some of the risky asset exposure. The other issue that all you know investors are facing in this summer environment is it's been a, an exceptionally illiquid environment, very expensive to trade. Uh, and so using cash as, a, as opposed to other means to bring your risk down is, is just a more efficient way of reducing transactions costs and, 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 and retaining value for our investors. What do you do on duration here? As a general statement at BlackRock, what do you do on duration? You guys are going to have 20 of you in a meeting. Yelling and scream is going to assume. You know, we just we just understand that. Probably Kosterich will be rude. I mean, that's just usually the way it is. But then Jeff Rosenberg, what's a duration call? Well, I think the duration call, you know, I'll speak for our, our team. Obviously, as you highlighted, there's a lot of different voices. and You're going to hear some more voices in Jonathan's program uh, in the next hour. But uh, it's still a cautious view on, on, on duration here. Again, that's the view of the uncertainty of inflation. Markets are pricing certainty. We're going to have a clean path to 2%. We are more skeptical about that being realized. And if it is not realized and you end up with higher inflation, the whole bond curve, inflation, risk premia, uh, they need to reset higher. And so you got to be a bit more defensive on duration with that uncertainty. Uh, Jeff Rosenberg, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it uh, right now. Lisa, let's sum this up, please, with futures negative 43, Dow futures negative 222, and the VIX 22.37. Yeah, just to frame this, before this payrolls report, we were fluctuating between gains and losses, kind of meandering. The reaction was so fierce and so quick. I mean, honestly, it was very clear. And I've got to say that 1.4 percent decline right now, Tom, on uh, on the NASDAQ catches my attention. <laughs> it is a repricing in equity yeah. markets to what bond markets are saying. Forget well, the, hawk the, uh, the, the dovish pivot. 
it isn't going to happen, not with numbers like these. I haven't seen the standard deviation study yet, but I would think the Dow futures negative 220 would be negative 400, negative 500, negative 600, and we're certainly not there uh, at this point. Again, the key number on the screen is that measurement of the difference of yield between the two-year and the 10-year and a negative 42 basis points. That is a jaw-dropping statistic. I did some very careful work earlier this week off the Bloomberg terminal and the descent of the two-year inversion, the speed of this movement of a two-year yield higher than the 10-year harkens back to what we saw in the late 1970s. Ira Jersey knows that history, chief U.S. rate strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Ira, let's start with that first. If I take the vanilla spread, the two's tens, its first and its second derivatives are absolutely stunning. What does that signal? Yeah, it signals that we're probably going to go even more. And and I agree with the sentiment that this payrolls report has to, uh, you know, has to readjust where all the front end yields in particular are going to go. You know, the, the long term yields don't necessarily have to um, uh, move significantly higher than than certainly not out of the ranges that they've been in so far this year, because because at some point in the future, we're going to have that recession that's going to be driven in part by the Fed and by a significant slowdown in uh, in both inflation and, and growth. So, so, so long end yields, you know, 10 year yields maybe hover 3% plus or minus 20 basis points, but it's really that two year yield that probably has to go up a lot more. Um, and, um, you know, if if we wind up getting to a five percent, and the market prices for a five percent Fed funds rate at some point, then two-year yields have to go up by still another eighty basis points, even after the big sell-off that we've had this morning. Which really raises a question, Ira, about the yield curve inversion. Tom was talking about it. We've all been looking at it as we watch it go more and more negative to the lows not seen since two thousand. How much can you give us a historical perspective on this portending some sort of recession? Is there some sort of translation? in terms of the depth of the inversion and the length and depth of recession. So n not necessarily. You, you know, we we got to the twos tens curve, for example, in the late 1980s, got to around negative 60 basis points, and we had a relatively mild recession uh, about a year after that. So so it doesn't necessarily have to be a particularly deep recession, but I, I think that the inversion in and of itself, you know, is a signal that the market thinks that there's going to be a significant slowdown in the not too distant future. But keep in mind, we we haven't been in a situation where you know all of the slowdowns in the past have been driven right. in large part. With inflation coming down, that's not the case now. So, so you know, could we do? Tom, Tom mentioned, you know, the 1970s the yield curve inverted by over 200 basis points back then. Now, I don't think in interest rates are going to go that high, and we're going to see a 200 basis point inversion. But certainly, a 60, 70, 75 well, basis point inversion is not out of the question. And, and we'll do some work on that, folks, and that's some proportional analysis we've got to get to. Our right, Jersey, I want to go to the optimist Neil Dodd of Renaissance Capital, who just wrote a blistering note talking about this unique report. And what's important in his math is the phrase, an inflationary boom. That can be level, Ira Jersey, but critically to me is the x-axis and the persistency of inflation across time. Is the x-axis going to be the key adjustment for the Fed, not the y-axis? Well, I think that I think that's part of it. If and if you mean that, you know, the Federal Reserve is going to do the Mary Daly route, go the Mary Daly route, and hike to four, four and a half, five percent, and then stay there stay for there. a long period of time. Yeah, that's completely possible. Well, but know, Ira, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but Ira, this is absolutely critical. Is today's phrase? This is the stay there jobs report. Well, I, I think it's heading there. You know, and certainly we have another report similar to this, and I think that has to become the consensus, um, almost no doubt. Because when I look at this report and I look at the aggregate labor income uh, figure, so um, so basically everything taken, it's growing still at nine percent year on year. Um, you know, was nine point three percent a month ago, but it's nine nine percent year on year aggregate labor income growth means everyone is going to have enough. Um, you know, income in in terms of um, to, to be able to continue to buy even amid higher prices. Now, you know, w will there be substitution effects because of what's going up? Yes, that will happen. But but the point is, is that with the labor market this strong, um, that means that you can have much more persistent inflation um, for large portions of the economy. And, um, and, and that really has to worry the policymakers. And that's why they might have to keep interest rates higher than what the market's currently pricing. I think Quite frankly, the market has 2023 wrong, and and I think that there's 
there's some opportunities there for for people to uh, to, to trade around that right now. Ira, if, if the market has 2023 wrong, where is it most wrong? Is it just on the front end, as we were saying, in terms of how much more people have to bring up their expectations for rate hiking? Or is it also on the long end, where there is a consensus right now baked into markets that that is safety, that the Fed will get inflation back down and that it will mean a lower growth trajectory ahead? Is that also in question as you talk about 4 or 5% Fed funds rates at a lo for a longer period of time? Well, yeah, I, I think that... It it really is the front end, you know, call it five years and in, that's still a little bit mispriced because we're still pricing for cuts in, in 2023. And and I don't think those cuts necessarily will come, or if they do come, it's like at the very end after we've hiked to 5%. Um, so, so, so I think that the long end, like I said, it doesn't have to move very much, but right. even a move from where we are now on the 10 year yield up to say 325 or 340, um, you know, that's still going to be a four or 5% decline in, uh, in the treasury index. In, in that part of the treasury index. So it still means a lot of pain for bond investors. So it, it's hard to mm -hmm. love the bond market right here with inflation this high and with uh, you know almost too much optimism on, on right. the path of inflation's decline. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Peter Bookfar just publishing over at Bleakley, and this is the economics of the moment, noticing the bang-up jobs report amid GDP declining. And as Bookfar says, productivity is plunging. We get some producti productive comments right now from Michael Casper on the stock market equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Let me get this straight. Hugely employed America. I don't think there's a recession. Don't stocks go up? How are you and Gina Martin Adams going to recalibrate? Not necessarily. So uh, as the previous two commentators said, this report is hugely inflationary, and we were really watching that hour, average hourly earnings figure. And up it went. And up it went, and it got revised higher for the previous month. So really, it's hitting companies' margins. And we're also starting to see some demand destruction here, where revisions for revenues over the next few quarters are starting to be cut. So really not a great picture for stocks. Michael, how much does this cut into uh, profit margins versus from the free cash flow that companies have that are doing really well? When I say about this, I mean paying uh, employees more at a time when they're starting to look to cut costs. Yeah, so so far, uh, margin expectations for 3Q and 4Q are down um, about 40 basis points each. And the revenue cuts that I mentioned are about equal size. So you're seeing 3Q uh, EPS estimates go down about 422 basis points, 4Q down about uh, 322 basis points. And then fiscal year 2023 is also down uh, about three percentage points over the last nine weeks, which is the largest cut we've seen over the same time frame uh, since we started recording this data back to 2010. Michael, you know, Tom was saying he was looking at the index, uh, the indexes, in particular the Dow, as he has wanted to do, and saying he's surprised that it wasn't down more. And it's a valid point considering the repricing we're seeing on the front of the yield curve. How much is this because of the resilience that we've seen in earnings versus perhaps misplaced optimism, as some people have called it? I, I think a lot of it is is the misplaced optimism, right? So um, people expected. Uh, you know, inflation to start coming down a little bit and maybe some signs for the Federal Reserve to maybe start easing in 2023 or at least take a pause. But inflation just keeps on chugging. So uh, you've got to really bake in kind of where the Fed's going. And it just seems to be the, the rates picture is going higher, higher and higher. This has been great. Way too short a visit, Michael. Come back after you guys rebrief and recalibrate over the weekend. It's going to be something. Michael Castro here with Bloomberg Intelligence. Alan Ruskin with a blistering short paragraph, uh, Lisa, as everybody comes into the Bloomberg terminal with opinion. The wonderful analyst at uh, Deutsche Bank, a million miles from recession, Lisa. Ruskin says positive for the U.S. dollar. It is positive for the U.S. dollar because it means more action by the Federal Reserve and it means strength. And strength should be a good thing. But right now it is a difficult, uh, difficult one for the Fed to swallow, considering that they're dealing with 9.1 mm. percent headline inflation. Pair this with an upside surprise to CPI next week. And then what happens, Tom? DXY up a full stick back to a 107 rounded up level. Not new, new highs on strength, dollar strength. But there it is in the equity market. Futures negative 42, down futures negative 230. A bit of a weight. The VIX out an exact stick, 22.44. A stunning report. And, of course, coming up, he'll have something constructive to say. The Secretary of Labor, Martin Walsh, with our John Farrell. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us.